this thing from recording. Uh, and if the rest of you want to turn on your mics. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, you guys can slide. You can slide those. You can slide both of those down. Cordero, Choyon Mandricar, DPD staff. Bob Azar, staff. Lisa Dinnerman, City so Senior Assistant City Solicitor. And I think everyone should have in their packets the meeting minutes. Um, Actually, we weren't no, able no, to prepare them for this okay. month. So I'd like to request that they be deferred to the following meeting. That's great. We will defer them. Then to the director's report. Okay, uh, just just one item, and I, I was hoping to have a couple more members here um, to talk about this. We are hoping to have a special meeting. We talked about it last time. Uh, next Tuesday was the date that we discussed the 18th. Um, can we at least poll who's here right now to see if, if you might be av available for that date? I'm not available. Nicole's not. Oh, I am. You're available next Tuesday. Okay. Yep. How about I'm you? Willing. I am. Okay. Likely not. Okay. So we have two. Uh, all right. We'll see if we can we can muster up another couple of folks. Um, as you know, we've got a, a sort of a crush of zoning changes that um, are uh, are pending and. Um, we're going to try and get through those, but uh, we'll see once the other members show up. We do, I know uh, at least two members were were running behind, um, but that's it. That's it for the uh, director's report. All right, we'll go to item number one, the request for extension for case number 22-008-MI-153-165 Gano Street, the applicant's Coastway Management LLC. Sure. Thanks, Madam Chair. And this is a request for extension for the preliminary plan of a plan that you had approved. The applicant has submitted a written request and is therefore asking that the project be extended for one year based on submission of that request, which they have given in writing, which they did not do the previous time. And I believe they are present uh, virtually and can make that request directly to you. Great. Yeah, Madam Chair, members of the commission, John Gowerhe on behalf of the applicant. Um, this was uh, technically approved as part of the project for the one year extension. And, and as Troyan had, had mentioned, uh, technically we needed to file a written request, which we have done because of the nature of the project requesting the one year extension. I'd like to make a motion to approve the extension for um, case number 22008MI. I'll second. All right, let's go around the room. Manuel? Aye. Joel? Aye. Harry? Aye. And I also vote aye. Extension granted. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Now we'll move on to item number two, development plan review, case number 2022-11, DPR 250 Lloyd Avenue, the applicant is Moses Brown School. Sure, and commissioners, a quick introduction. This is a request for development plan review for an amendment to the, to the master plan for Moses Brown School. They are, uh, they are a school and they are looking to make some changes to their athletic facilities. 
This particular change will deal with installation of a scoreboard and they also with on which they intend to have a video component that they will be telling you more about. In addition, they will also be talking about some improvements that they've made to the athletic facilities, but those do not require any action by you. So they will be mainly talking about the scoreboard and the video component that is included with it. So yeah, I can turn over to the applicant and they can tell you more. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the commission. My name is Amy Goins. I'm an attorney with Ursillo Tights and Rich in Providence here today on behalf of Moser's Brown School. Amy, just uh, you, you may want to, yeah, I know you're going to share your screen. I just want to make sure that, that you're muted on Zoom and also you need to turn your sound off. Otherwise, there's going to there's going to be feedback. Okay, I have my speakers on. Uh, you lower left. There you go. Perfect. Okay. There you go. Thank you. I'll repeat that for the public. Yeah, you want to turn your speakers off. Okay. Trying that again, Amy Goins, attorney with Ursillo Tights and Rich in Providence, Rhode Island, here tonight on behalf of Moses Brown School. Um, while we get set up, um, I'll introduce the team here with me. Um, to my left is Ron Dowlish, uh, interim head of school. Um, we also uh, have Peter Arpin, director of operations at Moses Brown School, as well as AJ Kizakai, director of athletics. Um, and finally, John Amato, who's a licensed professional engineer working as a consultant on this matter. He's uh, with JJA Sports LLC. As staff explained, tonight we're here seeking your approval of the amended development plan for Moses Brown School with regard to planned enhancements to the existing athletic facilities at the school, um, specifically including installation of a scoreboard with video capabilities and updates to the seating area and playing fields. Uh, I want to reiterate, as staff did, that this application does not include installation of lighting. We may be here before you seeking your approval of um, lighting enhancements at a later date, but not tonight. We have reviewed the staff report and are amenable to the condition of approval regarding operation of the video scoreboard pending the um, amendments to the zoning ordinance, which are under consideration by the ordinance committee, I believe, next week. Um, and tonight, um, we just want to explain why we're here before you um, proposing to uh, enhance the athletic infrastructure at the school. Um, and this is a resource that will not only benefit Moses Brown students, but it will benefit the community at large through the school's outreach and partnerships with local organizations such as the Providence Career Technical Academy. And through the presentation, we also hope you'll see that care has been taken to minimize uh, impacts to the surrounding uh, residential neighbors. So um, let me get this presentation up. I'll turn it over to my colleagues and I will pass out um, a hard copy of the presentation that you're about to see tonight. All right, I'll give it a minute for that presentation to go around. For those online, I'm Ron Delgleish, uh, interim head of school at Moses Brown. And while this is my uh, first year as interim head of school, this is my 14th at Moses Brown. So I'm, uh, in, I've been intimately involved in this project and a lot of the pieces that we'll be speaking with you about tonight. So thanks for having us. We appreciate it. Um, Okay, there we go. So, uh, as uh, stated in the introduction, um, the two key pieces that we come to you about tonight are to install a new uh, scoreboard at Moses Brown, uh, as well as an upgraded sound system. And then I want to give you the context uh, by talking through uh, the broader projects that these are a part of. So the why the video scoreboard is simple for us. Our scoreboard is 20 years old. Um, increasingly, it's uh, hard to find replacement parts. Um, and when you do find them, they're expensive. And so in doing all the work that I'm about to explain, this seemed like a natural moment for us 
uh, to update um, our scoreboard. And in doing that work, video boards are increasingly becoming the new standard for scoreboard uh, scoreboards. Uh, in fact, the Providence School Department recently replaced a number of scoreboards um, with video boards that include an outdoor uh, video component. There's a Providence Career Technical Academy, Central, Mount Pleasant, Classical Hope, Juanita Sanchez, and at Pure Independent Schools like Bishop Hendrickson. So Moses Brown is by no means the first public or private school to uh, request uh, such an installation. We are very much aware, as has been noted, that the use of the video component would be pending um, further approval by um, the zoning board. Um, so just a little bit about timeline and some other details. Um, with your approval, we would hope to install the scoreboard in a timely way. Um, later this month, uh, early October, we still would have to set a foundation, um, but we'd wanna move expeditiously um, if so approved. Um, we've taken a lot of time and expense to move the location of the scoreboard to the southeast corner um, so that the score, the, the face of the scoreboard faces back towards the campus. Um, that's, that is at a significant expense to us in terms of electrical and having to put a foundation there. And we did that because obviously the last scoreboard was where it was for 20 years. And we realized with this upgrade and any ambient light that might be coming from the scoreboard, we wanted it facing away from our neighbors on Weymouth and facing back towards the campus. Also important to note um, uh, for the commission that no sound comes from the scoreboard itself. The sound would emanate from a new sound system on the press box. Again, we'll show you the location of that and we'll show you the extent to which we've gone to ensure that sound that comes from that sound system meets the city noise ordinances. And uh, again, uh, my colleagues will have more documentation on that. Uh, further, our board has already taken steps to limit um, the potential use of the video component. Um, there'll be no uh, corporate adver advertising of any kind, and we will not allow any uh, um, outside rental groups, youth groups, um, to use the sound or video, the sound system or the video component of the scoreboard. So if there's an outside rental group, they'll simply be using the time and scorekeeping uh, capabilities of the board. We also have uh, contracted um, with a company to do not only for this, but for our whole, the whole scope of, of our property line along Weymouth, we've got quite a nice um, planting screen along um, Weymouth Ave. And we're trying to develop a long-term plan for replacement and renewal, and then a specific tree planting plan to enhance the uh, a natural screen on the back side of the scoreboard that would also um, face Weymouth. Um, so, there's a lot of detail on this, but just to orient you, this side here um, is uh, to the west is the main MB campus. This is the track as it exists now. The current scoreboard is in this, um, this corner here, the southeast corner, as I described. We're moving the scoreboard here to the northeast corner, so again, the face of the scoreboard faces back towards campus and really is invisible, we don't think, to any um, neighbors. Again, there's a, a lot of tree planting along Weymouth, and this is an area where we'd look to enhance um, some abervites or natural tree screening um, behind the scoreboard to eliminate any um, visual impact um, on our neighbors. Um, so uh, moving ahead, as described, we just want to give you the broader context um, of why the scoreboard and the sound system. We completed in the in the white here. We just completed and opened this fall a complete uh, renovation and expansion of our lower school, which was an eight million dollar project. We're now in process on a complete renovation of all of the play spaces. There's one here that I'm circling with our cursor. Uh, we're, and we're enhancing the seating. Um, capacity, the, the seating and the capacity of seating, but we're doing this with a natural um, looking material, not the aluminum stand, so that we hope it'll fit into the, the sort of natural landscape. Here will be a new press box and then patio area with um, 
handicap seating. We're, we're enhancing the full handi handicap accessibility um, in terms of our viewing areas um, for this field. And then up here is the area of the other play space um, that we're upgrading. So it's in the context of these projects that have all been approved and are underway that we'd like to upgrade the scoreboard and the sound system at the same time. When I mentioned the sound system will emanate from the press box, that is this white area up here behind the stands right on the 50 yard line that I'm circling with my cursor right now. Just that these are just some other visuals. This is looking from the field back at that newly renovated and expanded lower school. Um, this is the, sorry, I, Oh. Sorry about that, friends. Let me do that. Open it up. Okay. And I don't know why the color. I don't know why the the shading. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so this is just a look uh, at some at some rendering so you can get a sense of the, the different visuals and sort of the aesthetic that we're really trying to fit this in with the natural landscape of our campus. This is the stands, the press box I mentioned, and that upper play area. Um, this is what the actual scoreboard itself um, would look like with the dimensions. It's important to point out that every dimension of everything below Campanella Field there is, is um, controlled by computer and you can shift the, the ways this is aligned. So this is just sort of a traditional alignment with the video in the center. But again, until we had such approval by zoning, we, could, we would just use the, the traditional scoreboard functionality of time, score, um, you know, and football down in distance, whatever the sport uh, might be. But we just wanted to give you a sense of the, the look of the scoreboard um, itself. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, my colleague, John Amato, to say a little bit more about the work we've done on the city sound ordinances and the design of the, um, of the system. So John, would you mind coming up? Um, good evening. Uh, my name is John Amato. Is this work? Yeah. Okay. No, uh, my name is John Amato, and I'm a civil engineer. Uh, my company is JJA Sports, um, and I have the luxury of designing nothing but outdoor athletic facilities. It's a, it's a fun program. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, what you see before you. Um, as part of, and, and we'll look at another plan after this, but just to, as part of our research in terms of meeting requirements, um, we, we pulled up, um, I believe this is called section 16 uh, in, the, in the ordinance and the sound requirements, how loud a certain sound can be uh, and meet the, the regulations in the community. And we're in a residential zone, even though we're a school, the school's allowed in a residential zone, but, and they have hours set from 7 a.m. to 9.59 p.m. We're allowed 65 decibels BA, and that's a certain type of reader. Um, sound meter that works is multiple sound meters. BA is what's referenced um, in the regulation. And after that, it needs to go down um, to five to uh, 55, sorry. Um, that's until from 10 p.m. until 60, 59 p.m. So in looking at how our site behaves currently, uh, can we jump to the next slide? I think it's the next slide. I'm sorry, you can't, no, one more. Here we go, all right. Um, the next slide is, uh, the staff from Moses Brown went out and did some readings on the site during a lacrosse game. Uh, there was a whole bunch of different activities. They have a PA system they currently use. Um, and what we did is we had readings. Um, the top line is along the front property line, sidewalk area on Weymouth Street. Um, the left-hand side is the north end. The right-hand side is the south end. Um, and at the property line, uh, we were reading, and there was different conditions. We can go over that. Reading from uh, a high of 65 to a low of 56 at the property line. And that was at around 4, 4 p.m. afternoon lacrosse game. 
different sounds. Um, uh, things like a whistle. A whistle was um, a whistle was higher. Uh, a cheer was higher. But the PA system, the thing we we can control, um, falls into that guidelines. Now the bottom row is at the top of the hill at the fence line. If you're familiar with the track, um, there's a fence at the edge, at the top edge of the slope, and you could see our our readings were from 58 to 66, 67 decibels at that location. So they're pretty close to what is allowed within the framework of, of the zoning ordinance. Uh, but what we do have is, as Ron had indicated, we're looking to provide some screening, some additional, additional vegetation along. And when we put our PA system up, what we'll do is we'll tune that. So we'll have presets on the PA system, preset volume levels that the kids can't change. Um, and what will allow us to do is to take readings, design the sound levels on the site. And if we have areas that we need more sound control, then we'll do additional screening at that time. But there is a plan to screen um, with vegetation, uh, the view to the, uh, the field area. But right now, based on the coverage we have, um, we're, we're right at there. We're, our high was 65. Um, I think the loudest sound we had um, was it listed here? The loudest sound we had was uh, one of those little Honda Civics raced up, bubbling by, and that was 82, um, just to give you an idea. Uh, we're talking right now, we're talking at about 65, or I'm talking at about 65 decibels. If I talk high, that's going to go up, it's going to jump to 72, but to give you an idea. So the sound levels aren't high, we're in those in the ranges um, required uh, by zoning, and we think we've uh, We'll be able to accomplish this or better. And again, when the PA system is installed, we'll fine tune that to make sure that at the property line we are not violating any of the requirements. All right. What, do you want to show the placement, John? Uh, yes. Let's go back and uh, look at that. So let's let's start. Let's go back to the site plan before we jump to that. If I can find the site plan. Okay. Um, Ron had indicated where, where the uh, press box is. It's down here on the bottom. Uh, the, the center of the field lines up with almost the center of the press box down at the bottom mm -hmm. over here. And since this project is going to be um, potentially added to later on in life, uh, right now we're putting the, the speakers on the press box because that's the only structure that we have at the time. So the speakers will be designed for that location, that height above ground. And what we'll do. I'm going to go to the next slide showing a cross section. Um, and the cross section shows the evil sport lights. Um, but why it's there is because it shows some angles at how we design our PA, our lighting system, our PA system. Sorry. Um, we put our speakers at a point and point them down so that the sound cone bounces off the field as opposed to heading straight out towards the neighbors at the hill. So for example, um, the football team, the visiting football team would be at this end on the right side and the sound, the top of the sound cone, and the sound comes out like this, but speakers, uh, nice speakers, you can control that a little bit. Not a lot, but you'll have a sound cone and what you'll be able to do is you'll point the top half of that down so it hits the field in front of the athletes. You'll get sound beyond that. But again, what we'll do is we'll set the volume based on the sound requirements. Um, and if they decide at one time that they need that in the future, we'll do the same thing on the other side. Um, sound can be controlled uh, and it can be controlled with volume, but more importantly with angles and the type of speakers. So that's, that's our intent and that's our plan. And as I mentioned earlier, um, the goal is to meet the uh, city of Providence requirements for sound levels. You're welcome. No, I can't just take off the questions. We're gonna, I we're can't. Gonna, we're gonna keep going here. Uh, on, can I? Great. So again, we just wanted to point, we just wanted to show with John who's worked with us that we, we have tried to make an authentic effort to make sure that whatever our plan is meets um, the city ordinance. Um, and we've also tried to be transparent about the realities of things that have been going on on this field for a long, long time, like a crowd cheering or a referee whistle blowing. And we wanna be uh, transparent, right? About the sounds that those create, but being clear in the planning on what you're approving that um, 
what the conditions are now and with the technology and the system we have, we'll have a lot more ability to control and test um, the sound to make sure we're living up to that, um, to that ordinance. Um, so I want to introduce our athletic director, AJ Kizukai, who will talk more about the specific use parameters on the video board. How are we going to use um, this board? AJ? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is AJ Kizukai, Director of Athletics at Moses Brown, and I'm just here to uh, talk with you all a little bit about the intention of the video board and how we uh, intend on using it. Uh, so the primary way in which we plan on using the board won't be any different than what we've used uh, boards in the past, and that's to keep uh, time, score, down, distance, et cetera. Um, the scoreboards uh, with a video component is starting to become a uh, new technology um, and starting to become the norm. So at this point in time, um, we're using this as, as an opportunity to make sure that we're staying up to date with current technology and that will position us for uh, success and to continue to uh, provide the best uh, experience for our student athletes uh, in the future. Obviously, we'll continue to use the board um, for uh, time and, and just actual functioning of a, of a game um, until a time comes in which we're allowed to potentially use the uh, video component. Um, any additional um, um, pieces that we would uh, utilize these boards for um, in the future, if we do have a video component um, allowed to us would be to highlight our student athletes, um, our students across campus, um, different campus events that might be taking place on campus and, and really use it as that opportunity. Um, additionally, uh, a big piece when we were looking at um, the next phase of upgrades to our facilities and we started researching uh, video boards, we saw this as a great opportunity uh, to teach our students. Um, as we all know, with, with technology and just with the age that we're in right now, um, graphic, audio, visual um, production, that's really something that students are really into. And we started having uh, conversations initially uh, with PCTA just to gather information and it quickly became, well, this would be a great opportunity for us to partner and, and teach students at both institutions and hopefully get to the point where it's within the community as well. Um, we've also ventured out and had some conversations with Brown University in ways to find some of those professionals to come over and, and teach our students as well. Uh, so yes, this is great in terms of the athletic component and me sitting here as the athletic director, I see it more than um, at an athletic piece. Um, I see this as an opportunity to really teach our kids and, and set them up for a success. We recognize that not everyone um, is going to be on the playing field, but to give students an opportunity to be engaged in athletics, um, even if they're not on the field, they'll be able to do so in another way. Um, so that's just what I wanted to share with you all, just to reiterate that the prime function of this board will continue uh, to be in terms of allowing us to function and have time and score. Um, there will be some times in the future, hopefully, uh, for us to expand a little bit and continue to give students an opportunity to, to learn new skills. All right. Thank you, everyone. And just a couple more points, uh, as AJ has on the slide. We do imagine that there could be time to time where we might have um, a movie night out there. I want to be clear to the commission, this is not new for us. We've put up temporary screens and had movie nights out there previously. So while this will make it a lot easier for us, it's not, it's not necessarily a new functionality. The other piece we hope to do is to be able to advertise um, community partnerships. Our, our school does a lot of community outreach and service. We'd also love to use the board to be able to promote some of those community organizations that we work with on a regular basis. Um, Ron, just before we go on, when yep. you talk about the outdoor events that Moses yep. Brown has, has hosted on its campus in recent years, yep. is that before COVID yeah. as well as yeah. in over the past couple of years? We haven't done a lot of group gatherings um, or movie nights during COVID, but pre-COVID, um, once or twice a year, we might do outdoor movie nights. And again, sometimes they've been on the turf field. Sometimes they've been um, on other parts of our campus. And theater performances as well? Theater performances during COVID were done. We did a couple of outdoor theater performances. We don't necessarily see that happening as much now that we're back in the Woodman Center. But yeah, we've had outdoor. I mean, you, know, you, you all know we've got an incredible campus. So we take advantage of the outdoor spaces for lots of different events. So I don't think... I don't imagine, we want to be transparent about that use, but we don't imagine that it's going to be 
it's going to create a lot of new events that haven't happened in the past. Okay. Uh, last person, our last slide, I want to call up our director of operations, Peter Arpin. We want to, we thought it would be appropriate in sharing with you some of the things, the ways we're upgrading the campus. Um, and again, this is really a recommitment and we talked to our neighbors about this when we did a Zoom in August with, um, with the councilwoman uh, about some of the commitment we made to our neighbors on a regular basis. Pete? Well, you got, you got something fun to show too. <laughs> so you know everybody, my name is Peter Oppen, Director of Operations. You gotta get up, get up close to the mic. <clears throat> and Moses, over at Moses Brown. So this year, I know John alluded to us taking the readings. I was actually one of the guys that went outside and took the readings during the lacrosse game. This is the, one of the meters that we use. So it wasn't like we were just using some app on our phones or something. We actually had legitimate meters. So I just wanted to show you guys what we actually did use. Uh, Moses Brown has always tried to be good neighbors with our neighbors. We do leaf clean up yearly. It kind of fell off the radar a little bit during COVID, but we're trying to get back to that this year. Um, we also plow around our campus. The outskirts of our campus is we're plowing our campus. We will circle the block and actually continue plowing outside on the city streets. Um, as part of this project, we're looking at additional, like they were talking about some windscreening uh, possibilities on our fence with some uh, noise barrier and some uh, decorative windscreening for our own purposes. We are looking at um, upgrading our tree line. So right now, our, our harbor, arborist went out there last week, knocked a bunch of dead trees that we have over there, and he's looking at getting a plan for the soil study and for what we can add to the tree line to help kind of fill in the gaps that we have right now. We are going to install some larger arborvitaes behind the, uh, the, the scroll wood when it goes in. And there's also a, a bin that we put on our softball field last year for storage that we had planned on putting some arborvitaes behind that. One of our neighbors actually made a comment about it at one of our previous meetings, but it was definitely in our game plan. Um, we do have a guy that goes around campus on a regular basis picking up garbage on the outskirts of our campus. And if we had a major event, we would make sure that happened the following day. And we're also step up our security on a larger events, we either hire a police detail or bring in our outside firm that has security guns. So that's our game plan to help continue being good neighbors. Thank you. So again, we appreciate your time. We hope that that was trying to give a good overview to help you pro provide some context or how the scoreboard and the sound system fits into the broader work that we're doing. And we're happy to answer any questions you might have. And I have the team here and I'll help have them help me should uh, they be in a better position to answer. Thank you. I think it makes sense to go around the room and see if any commissioners have questions. Um, just my go literally around. Manuel, do you have any questions? No. Noel? No. Harry? <clears throat> well, um, I, I have a number of questions, but um, I, I, I guess I wondered, since you, the ordinance is under review, I guess, by the city council right now, I wonder why you chose to bring this forward now. Um, and why not wait until you hear from them rather than ask us to make an exception to the audit to the uh, ordinance? Oh, well, Mr. Bilodeau, I want to be clear. We're not asking the commission for any waivers or exceptions tonight. We are amenable to the condition of, of approval that prohibits operation of the video component of the scoreboard until such time as the ordinance has been amended. Um, so the scoreboard can certainly be used and still images can be displayed in conformance with the ordinance. So again, um, you've heard from the team, the um, facility enhancements is something that the school wanted to begin preparing for as soon as possible. So we didn't wanna leave it all um, you know, pending the city council's review. We would ask for your favorable action on this, again, with that condition of approval so that the video operation wouldn't be uh, allowed until the ordinance is amended. So really all you're asking for is that the permission to move the um, scoreboard from where it is now to where Ron showed it to be. Is that it? Is that all you're asking for? I mean, why all the video language, I wonder? I, I mean, I'm, as you know, I'm a supporter of Moses Brown for over 40 years. Um, and I, um, 
find it very uncomfortable actually to be opposing, to be listening to this in a way. Um, I think moving the um, scoreboard is fine with me. You can move it wherever you want. Actually, I think moving it to where you are is a good idea. But the video screen is um, a hurdle I just can't clear to use a, you know, uh, athletic metaphor. Harry, I appreciate that. And uh, again, as was stated, we're ready to use the scoreboard with static images and the scoring components. Um, and I leave it to uh, the broader review that's happening on video. I, I just would, I would just say for the commission that video is being used all around the city of Providence on scoreboards right now, including right across the street from us um, at Brown. So it's also not something that is not in use well beyond our campus. We totally respect whatever level of approval we're given and we'll live within um, the ordinance and the directive because we need a scoreboard irrespective of the video component. And this was the direction that we'd want to go in um, irrespective of whether we're able to use the video or not. I hope, I hope that makes sense. It does, it does. In fact, it's a great relief. I certainly support Moses Brown Athletics as you know and uh, But I just find the, the TV screen in the middle of a um, residential neighborhood a hurdle I can't clear. It's, um, you know, land use B4 specifically says one of our primary obligations is to mitigate the impact of non residential use in resident. Uh, in neighborhoods that are, that have residential use, that's one of our primary goals, and, and uh, I so uh, I'm much relieved that if that's what you're looking for, you have my blessing to move the uh, move the scoreboard. That's for sure. Video is another matter. Well, and can I just clarify with with Bob and Seth? It's from my reading of the staff report is we're not approving the video component today that you know this says operation of the video. If, if we adopt the recommendation if the operation of the video component of the score scoreboard shall not be permitted unless an ordinance is amended and that's a separate the ordinance amendment is not before us today no uh correct that that ordinance amendment actually came in front of you a, a few months ago and it's going to be heard by the city council's committee on ordinances next week uh this was part of that um, larger package of, of zoning changes uh, that, that we brought to you. And um, they acknowledge, the, the applicant acknowledges uh, that that ordinance has not passed um, and that they, they'll comply with the existing ordinances until and unless that ordinance does pass. By the way, you did make a positive recommendation to the city council to approve that ordinance that would allow for video. Uh, it, it, and and uh, you may recall that the language specifically uh, said as a, as a, uh, a way to protect, um, uh, you know, to, to mitigate this impact as you speak of Mr. Bilodeau uh, for non-residential uses in residential areas. Um, if, if this ordinance goes into effect, it specifically says that uh, the, the video scoreboard shall be oriented towards the field of play. And I think they've, they've demonstrated that that would be the case here. They did, they did. Thank you, Bob. And thank you, Nicole, for your legal opinion. <laughs> Does it sound like you go from Yes. Chair, do you have any questions? Based, any, based on this discussion, does anyone of the commission have any further questions? All right, I think we can release the applicants for now, staff report, and then do we accept public comment on these? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Commissioners, I'd just like to say that we do have a sign up sheet at the desk. So if you'd like to speak, please sign your name and we can call you up to speak. Thank you all. You'll get called up again if there's any questions that need to be answered. Thank you. And commissioners, so you've seen the applicant's presentation. And just based on that, we would like to point out that this is a use that is that conforms to the underlying zoning of R1. 
where primary and secondary schools, including athletic facilities with scoreboards are permitted by right. So based on what they presented, the dimensions and function of the scoreboard will conform to the ordinance, except for the video component, which as discussed, you know, will be permitted upon, upon amendment of the zoning ordinance, which you have, which you have recommended in favor of. So based on that, we would say that based on their presentation and what they have submitted, the applicant's amendment does conform with section 1202M of the zoning ordinance pertaining to development plan review for primary and secondary educational facilities. And, you know, we should note and again reiterate that this approval does not include site lighting. And based on that, we recommend that you approve the master plan amendment subject to the condition that the the video component of the scoreboard shall not be permitted to operate until the ordinance is amended to allow for that. Thank you. Now we'll open it to public comment. It does appear that there are folks in the room who would like to speak on this. And then we also are allowing virtual public comment. So if you are in the virtual room, you can raise your virtual hand. Uh, what is it, star six or nine? star nine? To raise your hand if you're on the phone. Okay, so uh, we have two folks in the room signed up. Uh, Matt Goodman is first, and uh, Mr. Goodman, you can go up to the table there and speak into the microphone. Yeah, you know what, we have a, a lot of items on the agenda today, and so we're going to try to do a three minute time limit if you could keep your comments and this goes for you, but also everyone who's testifying in person and um, on the on the phone or virtually if you could keep it to two to three minutes, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Matt Goodman. I live on Weymouth Street and uh, I have a question about the the, the uh, sound and specifically the public address speaker placement section that you guys uh, submitted. And my question is, should you, the recommendation to approve, be approved um, for the development plan amendment, does that also include putting the public address speakers on poles of 60 and 80 feet as is submitted in the master plan by Moses Brown? And that's that slide that they submitted, it shows that the uh, public address system is on a pole that's 60 feet on one side and 80 on another. So that's my question. Madam Chair, yeah, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's not the case, but we can pose that to, to the applicants. I believe that that indication uh, was for, um, that, was a, that was a document that indicated uh, potential site lighting that is not part of this application. And uh, I think that was not the intent, but we could certainly have them uh, come up, not now, but after public testimony to answer that question. Thank you. We'll have them come back after all the public testimony. Okay, next in the room, um, Emma. M. M. I'm sorry, you'll have to say your name. It's, it's a little hard for me to read. Hi, good evening. My name is M. McManamy. I live at 315 Only Street. Um, I may be the only person in the room who is a Quaker. I actually am a Quaker. <laughs> and I'm a, a very strong member of the Providence Friends Meeting, which is across the street next door to you all. Um, and in fact, it's interesting because in the past, the uh, Quaker... Um, New England Yearly Meeting of Quakers, that is the yearly, um, the, the um, New England group of Quakers um, actually had administrative authority over the school. I'm wondering what would be the response to this plan if that were still the case. I do think there would be some concerns in general. Um, I speak as somebody who is in the Northwest corner. I know that most of the attention is on Weymouth Street and, and that is as it should be. Um, but I also saw that an enormous tree came down um, that was an oak tree on the north, uh, on, the, on the western side over by the playground this year. Um, and as I understand it, any tree can prevent uh, transmission of sound and light. So 
I'm wondering um, what would be the plan long term for screening the north and the west side. Um, and, and I also wonder whether it would be possible for some of this AV um, drama or music kind of sessions that are going to be planned in the long run for that to be more in the interior of the campus instead of on the edge where all the people live. Because I think that for the Brown University sites and all the other ones, those are, those are farther away from where residential people are living and sleeping. So I'm, I'm, I have a, a longer term concern about that, although I understand that that is not being treated tonight. It is um, confusing to me that there was so much talk about um, uh, audio visual when it's not actually under discussion tonight. So I'm bringing that and hope that can be treated at a later date if it's not appropriate tonight. Thank you. Thank you. That's all we have uh, in person. And let me take a look at, I don't see any hands raised here, uh, but Councilwoman Anthony is here. And I think she would like to say something. Good evening, everyone. This is on. Um, <clears throat> My name is Helen Anthony and I am the city councilwoman for Ward 2, which is where Moses Brown is located. And thank you again for all the work you do for the city. I truly appreciate it. Um, I'm just here uh, to express um, my appreciation for Ron and his team for the engagement of the community. And we have met, um, he has met once in person, I think, or once via Zoom, then I con convened a community meeting. Then we had another community meeting with Bob, which was very helpful. Um, and I'll just say that we don't have a lot of people here tonight um, because the lights are not being proposed tonight, but I believe will be at a future date. And I'm sure you will see a lot of the community members at that meeting. Overall, I'm just gonna say that, uh, you know, the difference here is I understand that, you know, uh, Moses, excuse me, so sorry. I, um, that Moses Brown is, um, you know, trying to keep up with the state of the art capabilities, but we have to keep in mind that this uh, school is nestled in a residential neighborhood and literally sits on top of Weymouth Street, backs up on Arlington and also affects Olney. And so the difference here is that it really is on top of a residential community. So they are most concerned with the noise and light. That, that any change on the field is going to cause. So I do appreciate the efforts that Moses Brown has gone to to make sure that the video board is going to be facing inward. I would hope that they are going to be diligent in their um, compliance with the noise ordinance because that greatly impacts the neighbors. Um, so I, I, I hope that they will be diligent about measuring that and keeping the neighbors in mind in terms of the timing of events. They seem to be willing to work with the neighborhood. And um, I guess I'll say that I am sure we will be back to discuss this when they propose the lights. So I wanted to thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else here or virtually that would like to speak before we close the public comment? All right, let's close the public comment. And then it would be great if the applicant would be willing to respond to I the, the first comments about the, the depiction. Um, and then there was also a comment about a plan for screening. Hope could respond to those too. And also, Madam Chair, I just want to note that you received a letter from an abutter that was included in your packages from Mr. Eckler, just for the record. Yes. Thank you. So I'm going to have John Amato talk about this particular plan for the location of the speakers of the sound system for the public comment. Hello again. My name is John Amato from JGA Sports. Uh, I'm a civil engineer. I want to respond to the comment or question regarding the light pole section. The light pole section was used to show how the sound could be controlled by pointing the speaker in the right direction so that the speaker isn't shooting out towards the, the abutter's house. So what happens is that it shoots out vertically in a wave and horizontally, and it's like a cone. 
And all you do is you tilt it down, and what happens is the speakers hit the ground and will go up. And if, if any noise comes up, it goes up above the surrounding area. So we use that pointing angle. We use the width of the cone, both horizontally and vertically, the sound cone. And then we use the volume level to control. And then above that, there'll be more planting screening that'll be provided. And Peter had mentioned, if, if we need to, we'll put in some additional sound barrier material um, to minimize any impact and allow us to stay within the zoning requirement of 65 decibels when it's being used. John, John, the question was, where are these speakers gonna be mounted? The speakers will be mounted on the press box. Which is how high off the ground, roughly? It's about 20, five feet off the ground, the top railing. Of so the not box. they're not mounted on the light poles? No, they will, the light poles will not be there. Thank you. I wanted to also respond to the public comment first about the relationship that Moses Brown has um, with Quakers. In fact, we maintain a strong relationship with the New England Yearly Meeting of Friends and by our bylaws, a third of our Board of Trustees are uh, Quakers. And when this issue of the video scoreboard came up, AJ, our athletic director, um, created a working group with friends on the board who expressed um, concern. And it was some of the restrictions that we put in place relative to advertising and uses. Um, we already made those decisions internally um, because of conversations we had with um, the Quakers who serve on our board. So, um, I wanted to make sure that um, that it was noted that Quakers on the Moses Brown board connected to NEYM, jointly appointed to the Moses Brown board by the New England Yearly Meeting of Friends have been engaged in this conversation with us to this point. Um, the, other, the other questions of um, planting and screening to the north, any tree that gets taken down on Moses Brown's campus is done in consultation with an arborist. So that tree was taken down because they didn't believe it was sustainable or would survive the construction. And we always um, plant trees, replacement trees. We're totally open to conversation with neighbors about additional screening. We, we love the vegetation on our campus. We try to maintain it. We spent a lot of money to maintain it and add to it. So we'd be totally open to neighbors along the only, in terms of the meeting house and also along Olney Street to be thinking about um, any plantings along that side, that hasn't been an issue that's come up to us mostly. Most of it has been along Weymouth and that's where we've uh, focused our efforts, but we're totally open to further conversation around additional plantings on that side of our campus. Perfect, thank you, thank you so much. Okay, commissioners, any comments or thoughts that folks wanna raise? Or are folks ready to make a motion? <laughs> I can't well, make the motion, that's yeah. the chair. <clears throat> uh, well, I guess uh, I'd like to show some goodwill. So I'll make a motion to approve this development plan amendment, um, which will not include the video component. And does not include 60 or 70 foot light poles or any lighting at this point. And um, I make a motion to, uh, to approve the master plan amendment with the following objections. Operation of video component of the scoreboard shall not be permitted until ordinance is amended to allow for video displays. We have a second. I'll second this. Let's go around. Chair? Uh, I'll abstain. I came in halfway through. Manuel? Aye. Miguel? I'll abstain as well. Noel? Aye. Harry? Aye. I also vote aye. Now I'll hand it back over to the chair. All right, that motion carries. Thank you very much, Nicole. And sorry for my uh, tardiness. It's hard juggling uh, child care. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you. Um, so we're. Um, we're wrapped up on case uh, agenda items number one and two. Uh, we're going to jump ahead uh, based on a request uh, from a petitioner uh, to agenda item number five. It's city council referral number 3517. 
It's 180 George M. Cohan Boulevard. The petitioner is 180 GMC LLC. Now we're going to take that one out of order this evening. And uh, Choyan, Bob, which yeah. one you would like <laughs> I'll, to? I'll, uh, I, I'll take this one. Uh, so this is a uh, fairly straightforward petition uh, to change the zoning of a parcel of land at George M. Cohan Boulevard. This is uh, uh, at the corner of George M. Cohan and East Street, right uh, near the pedestrian bridge that takes you over to India Point Park uh, in Fox Point. And uh, this building, some of you may know as the former Top Lawton House, that was a nursing home uh, before that business moved to East Providence. It's a massive structure in the R2 zone. Uh, and the, uh, in recent years, it had been used as um, a sort of a dormitory for a, uh, uh, for a company that was, was housing um, foreign students who were going to primary and secondary schools. Uh, and now the parcel's uh, been purchased and uh, the, the current owner wishes to uh, develop this into housing. Um, uh, and because this, this building is so big, uh, it, it could not possibly accommodate only two units that would be allowed in the R2 zone. Uh, it so happens that this is adjacent to the W2 zone, which is a waterfront zone, which is um, uh, to a large extent, uh, the same type of zone as, as a C2 zone. It would allow for multifamily housing. Um, and uh, we believe that this would be an appropriate zone for this parcel. Um, the, um, uh, so, you know, that, that's about all I have to, to say about this. Uh, we, we did talk about in our, our staff report, the fact that uh, this has received a variance uh, from the, the zoning board. It's actually received two variances, one for use and one for dimension for parking. Um, if this zoning change passes, they won't need uh, the use variance. Uh, they will still need the dimensional variance because, because it still would not conform to the uh, parking regulations of that zone. Um, so we had said uh, as a condition of approval that they uh, would have to abandon the use variance upon approval of the zoning change. Council um, admonished us that that may not be uh, possible, uh, abandonment of, of, of use variances, um, something I think we ought to talk about with respect to state law, uh, Madam Vice Chair. But um, uh, such that it is, uh, they are uh, also requesting an extension of their of their zoning variance. Uh, and we may want to discuss with the applicant that uh, they should really do one or the other. And perhaps if the zoning change does pass, they may uh, relinquish the, the, the extension of the zoning variance and allow that to expire. But for the time being, the only thing that's in front of you is the zoning change and uh, feel free to disregard our uh, recommendation uh, our condition, uh, not the recommendation that it be approved, but the condition. I, I just want to object to, I just want to note that I didn't admonish. <laughs> <laughs> I pointed out that the law, as, as Mr. Azar always points out to me, there is an illogical, what we think is illogical um, state provision that says that you can't, that while you can abandon a non-conforming use, you can't abandon the variance. So, um, I don't know if you, if Dylan, I don't know if you spoke with Alexis today, but that was the gist of what we talked about was that, you know, get your extension, but then not get another extension if this is approved. So that in effect, you don't have anything to abandon and we can just extend the dimension for the names. Understood. Um, my name is Dylan Conley on behalf of the applicant. Uh, I, I believe Kevin Diamond is on. He can give a presentation uh, with result to it. I, Really, it's pretty straightforward. We're not looking to change anything from our use variance, which was approved. We don't have an objection to relinquishing the use variance, assuming it doesn't have some impact that we don't foresee. My only current concern is whether or not any of the financing is tied to the existence of the use variance currently. I don't know as I sit here. We, we don't have any objection to relinquishing the use variance, assuming that that's not the case. And just for clarification, for our edification, even though it's not in front of us, what is that use variance for currently? So it's a it's a 71 unit 
uh, conversion. It's residential, purely residential. Uh, it's a federal historic tax credit project. One of the reasons why we submitted for the use variance and for the zone change, one, the use variance uh, elements are, are very high in birds and meat. Secondarily, uh, the seller and related to the sale, it was incredibly important that we got at least something approved in a very tight window. Mm -hmm. and the zoning board was incredibly accommodating, giving us, in fact, a special meeting when they requested further evidence. Um, so we're very grateful to the city and the board for that. Uh, but we are here sort of finishing up and trying to clean up. Uh, a quick example of why this is very valu valuable is we're hearing from the federal historic uh, tax credit advisors that there was a hallway in our use variance approval that was being converted into living space underneath their original recommendation of how the design should work. They are now recommending that that hallway remain a hallway. That's a bit of a problem for us uh, underneath the use variance environment, but it's not a problem for us underneath the zone change. So I won't belabor the point. We're really not going to change anything based on what was already approved in front of zoning, uh, but a zone change has much more flexibility in terms of unit layout uh, in the future than the use variance. Does. And, and you recently obtained this use variance? A matter of months ago. It feels like years, but it was a matter <laughs> of months ago. That's that's uh, that's impressive. All right. Uh, I think it was in March. Wow. It was, yeah. I, I haven't heard of any recent use variances approved, so that's... I think that means Good we're work. doing our job well. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Do we have the applicants? Oh, yeah, I, I mean, you know, if... If I I, I, I'm it. not. I'm not sure that. I'm not really sure that you. I, I think. Right, I think council, council described pretty accurately what what this is about. I mean, we're more than happy to do it, but in the interest of time, I, I agree. Um, I, I don't think it's it's necessary. It's basically the existing nursing home rooms are being converted into studios and one bedrooms in a nutshell. Okay, I do agree that uh, the two units in that building <laughs> is a, a little bit uh, unrealistic. <laughs> Uh, commissioners, do you have any questions for the applicant before we open this up to public comment? Just to uh, clarify, I, I thank you to uh, to council. I think I understand now. I, when I first read this, I wasn't under. There's a um, there's a conforming use for this building already, so I didn't re recognize the reason why you wanted it to change to W two since it was being used that way anyways. But per your Testimony today, it sounds that both for the federal tax credit and financing reasons, it just makes things smoother and and not the- uh, it, it really eliminates a ton of unnecessary risk for the project. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Never mind. Okay. No, I, I'd just like to say, I think it's great that it's being used for this purpose. Um, it, uh, just a wonderful, huge building, and uh, it will be wonderful housing, I think. I congratulate you guys for sticking to your guns, getting it done. Very, very visible from uh, from 195, that's for sure. Um, okay, with that, um, any if there are no more questions for the applicant, we can always bring them back. Let's, uh, let's open this up to public comment. If uh, or, or hear the staff report first, I think we pretty much yeah, yeah you heard here. the staff report. Um, th this would uh, because it's it's adjacent to uh, the W two zone. This would be consistent with the uh, comprehensive plans future land use map, um, and uh, and our recommendation is that you approve the rezoning um, to W two. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is there anyone here in the actual room that's uh, here to testify on this matter? Comment in any way, shape, or form? Nobody signed up. And uh, is there anyone in the virtual world, if you are interested in commenting on this agenda item, again, it's agenda item number five, um, please raise your virtual hand or press star nine if you're calling in. Not seeing any. And seeing none, okay. Um, that will we will close the public comment portion of this agenda item, and we will continue on to deliberation. I'm willing to make a motion that we recommend that the city council rezone the subject lot to uh, W2, subject to the condition. Or, no, uh, not actually, so we're not going to. So just yeah. period, subject lot to W2, period. Second. All right, we have a motion on the table. Let's go around, Manuel. Aye. Miguel? Aye. Noel? Aye.
Harry? Aye. Nicole? Aye. And I'll vote aye. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you, everyone. sir. And now we will go back in time to agenda item number three, which is a major land development project. It's a final plan review for case number 19-051 UDR. It's 311 Knight Street. Applicant is 321 Knight Street, LLC. Um, this is a UDR application. So we are acting as the uh, planning and zoning board. Um, Actually, are we? No, there's no because the, well, yeah, you 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 did um, uh, grant a zoning variance, but you're not. That's not before. So we you don't today. have to uh, swear. You you, you don't. Okay, good. No, we don't. We don't see the finals often. So yeah. that's right. And commissioners, this is something that you had requested of the applicant as your condition of preliminary plan review, that they return before you for to present the final plan to you so that they could show you certain design changes that they had made to the building at, at your request. And, you know, they include things that had to do with the facade as well as some elements on the facade as well as just the shape design of the building and its layout. So I guess when the applicant's ready, they can walk you through all the changes that you've made to your status, that they've made to your satisfaction. Okay, we'll, get, we'll give the applicant a couple minutes to, to boot up there. Take your time, we, we threw you off mixing up the agenda. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go easy on you. Thank you. Uh, I see an Eric, that's you, I take it? Okay. Uh, raise my hand. Oh, perfect, okay. Uh, make sure you're muted and make sure your sound's off. Okay, that's... Muted. Perfect. Yep. yep. That's good. So yeah, I'm going to share my screen. screen. Yep. Everyone see that? Okay. Go ahead and take it away whenever you're ready, Eric. Thank you. I'm going to shut my video off. I'm sure no one needs to. No. Oh. I can't do that. Okay. It was it was working. Yeah. All right, we're back. There we go. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman, uh, members of the board. Eric Suwana, Managing Principal of ZDS Architecture and Interiors. Uh, this, as uh, as already mentioned, this is a uh, final plan approval, and uh, there were a couple of uh, specific design elements that we wanted to review together as a team. Uh, at the previous hearing, we talked specifically about um, uh, the following items. Uh, we talked about the material color and texture of the walls behind the planting so as to resemble a storefront or provide the impression of transparency. Uh, that was at when, when this was heard, it was a CMU block uh, with the understanding that there would be ivy and vegetation growing in these planters that would really sort of uh, take over this inset area in our masonry facade at first floor. Uh, we're doing a the same brick veneer, but we're doing a, a basket weave pattern in those inset areas with a soldier course along the top. Uh, I will show you that in elevation. This job is, uh, construction documents are 100% complete, uh, fully coordinated with all consultants and ready to go into the ground uh, with your blessing. Uh, this is that uh, basket weave pattern inside those areas. Again, still uh, expecting to plant uh, landscape in these planters uh, to fill in this area, but I think the CMU was a little bit uncomfortable for the board uh, just because of the, um, the potential of maybe uh, greenery uh, not being present uh, throughout the year. And that's inset slightly? Inset slightly, yes. And I'll keep going and, and, and we can uh, uh, answer any questions on the close of this short design presentation. 
the second item was the material used for the roll down garage door on Westminster Street shall be decorative and employ a material that resembles glass. We're, we're actually not doing something that resembles glass. We are doing glass. We're doing a, uh, an overhead door system. It's called the 521 aluminum series uh, that will be uh, glazed uh, uh, panels. And uh, there it is in elevation. Uh, it's a pretty standard uh, commercial grade overhead door. I have actually I have a picture of it on my phone, but uh, I'll email it to myself and I can pull it up if people would like to hear more about that door. Um, the, the, one of the last items that was mentioned at the close of our previous hearing was the, um, the, the vertical nature of the, of the building. And I'm gonna go back to the first page. I think the rendering really tells the story best. Uh, so again, when this was heard previously, it, the colors were reversed. It was more a terracotta field with cream uh, um, accents. Um, we revisited that. In, in fact, uh, personally thought that the terracotta was a little bit too strong and overbearing, and it really gave the windows uh, with the cream color accents a little bit. It did uh, express of something in a more vertical nature. Uh, we widened out those accent areas and we flipped the, um, the material so that the field was a little bit more earth tone, uh, maybe a little bit less um, strong. Uh, and you see just in, the, in the, the setback areas up on the fifth floor, uh, we use that same terracotta color. Uh, also highlighting the, uh, the chamfered corner with this, uh, this proud bay uh, with some French balconies. We thought it was enough of that chestnut slash terracotta color. I have samples here to this evening. Um, and we thought it kind of gave a, 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 a better uh, composition and something of, of a little bit more handsome in nature. We also widened out the areas that are that accent color, which we think if you, this, this rendering might not communicate it best, but I'll pull up the elevations. Um, sort of, uh, dissolved the verticality uh, of the uh, accent colors. Um, and that was a specific comment by one member of the board. And I, and I, I believe even though he's not here this evening, I think we, we did him well. Um, happy to talk about that further. Uh, the plans uh, shall be updated, number three, plans shall be updated to distinguish the residential commercial entrances and make the residential entry appear less commercial in nature. We set that residential entry in um, and we, uh, we don't know the name of this project yet. <clears throat> Going to the first floor, sorry to be jumping around like this. We don't know the name of the property just yet, but um, I'll go to the elevation in just a second and we'll, we'll have uh, signage on the front fascia of the canopy, uh, the canopy over the commercial tenant on the corner uh, we'll have signage on top of the canopy. So we think that from a high rocky standpoint, the residential canopy is a little bit more residential in nature now and a little bit less commercial. Uh, again, just small nuances in detailing these pieces, I think kind of naturally progressed and, um, and, and sort of answered some of the comments that were brought up by this board. So we obviously, or we always appreciate the collaboration and it gave us uh, some boxes to check when we were moving through construction documents. I'll go to the elevation just to show you how that uh, translated into uh, elevation. Sorry. I usually have better drivers with me, these hearings. Actually, Bob is always a better driver than me. So I'm happy to do this for us. Uh, here is your. Uh, I resigned from that <laughs> position. Here, here is the elevation of that um, facade. Again, we're calling it 311 Knight Street. It's basically just a placeholder. You'll see to the right, you'll see that retail signage standing proud off the top side of the canopy. Again, we do not know what the retailer will be. We also do not know uh, the name of the property, but shows this elevation shows the continuation of a storefront. It also shows this uh, water table of brick veneer underneath the glazing, I think. Uh, and it also shows a frame around the doors where uh, previous versions was more of a buck glazed, full glazed um, assembly uh, at this entry, which I think the, the, the board uh, felt that that felt that that did not feel residential enough. Um, so we sort of uh, moved that forward. At least we feel that we've accomplished these 
uh, tasks or this homework that you this board gave us. Uh, that's it. Those were the, uh, there's five, six, and seven that are related to encroachment permits, uh, which we have uh, done, uh, merging lots prior to final plan approval. Um, maybe, Choyan, are you aware of that merging taking place or? Yeah, the applicant has submitted an okay, application for the merger, so we will be taking action on that soon. Thank you. Sorry for not having that uh, information myself. Uh, and here we are at the final mm -hmm. plan review. So again, I could elaborate on any of these details, um, but uh, here to answer any questions of the board. Okay. Um, commissioners, any questions of the applicant? This is a rare opportunity that we we chose to give ourselves of, of seeing the final plans uh, before construction. Um, I guess I'll kick it off first. Uh, if, if you're successful this evening, um, what's your rough schedule? You say that you have 100% construction documents. Would you be putting shovels in the ground this, this year? Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Manuel, anything? Okay, here we go. Uh, just for clarification where I know you don't, you don't have a name for it, but where it said Night Street, that's Westminster Street, right? Right. Just yeah. so, that, so that people who are watching it on Zoom <laughs> yeah. Yeah. know that's correct. what we're looking yeah. at. Uh, Noel, no. <clears throat> Harry. Well, I think it's just um, terrific improvements. And um, was Christian Potter the one who helped? No, it's a shame that he's not here. It was Louis Dorado. Oh, 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 oh. this now, goes Louis back. Dur oh, that explains. Well, Louis is a very skilled architect, and, and uh, you benefited from his. Uh, Plus sure cultural uh, affair with you. It looks great. Thank Lewis you. would like it. Will like it. Nicole. No questions or comments. Please. Well, Eric, I, th I thank you for coming back. Um, I know this has been a hard one, but uh, I think the time spent on it was well worth it because it does look like a, a, a better project overall. So, thank you again for your efforts. Thank you for all the cooperation. All right. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Eric. One more question. The, do you know where the state permit is? I think they're still waiting on something from the DOT. Yeah. Do you know they, where that stands? If I pulled up my email, you'll see the engineer oh, okay. and the client going back and forth uh, all day long about that item. So we're on it. Yeah. What, do you, what, what permit is that you're waiting this on? Is, uh, this is for the uh, sewer lines and utilities is what been, they've been talking about all day. Okay. Uh, I feel I, I don't know if I have closure, but I'd hate to pull up personal emails uh, at, at this you know, on screen for everybody. So that you have your encroachment permits, um, you have Forrester approval. You're submitted, all submitted. All submitted, yeah. okay. And we're just waiting on the, uh, the the merging of the lots and this final state permit. That's correct. Okay. So any approval would be contingent upon. Yeah, that, that's those. and that's that's part of our recommendation okay. that that they um, they get all their state approvals uh, and submit them with the final plan. Well, I guess then this is a good time to hear the staff report. Sure, commissioners. And the applicant has presented the changes that you had requested at the preliminary plan stage. And based on their presentation, we find that it's our belief that they conform to your um, suggestions. The, the plan conforms to your suggestions. And, you know, you'd already made the findings of consistency with the comprehensive plan compliance with the zoning ordinance, environmental impact buildable lot and street access at the preliminary plan stage. So those will still say, stay the same. And based on that, we would recommend that you vote to approve the final plan subject to these conditions, that the applicant applies for encroach above ground and underground encroachment permits when they, and submit them when they apply for building permits as discussed that they submit all state approvals with the final plan submission and that they return to the CPC if those approvals result in a change to the submitted plan. Then when they had submit their traffic study, there was a suggestion that they install a stop bar and a stop sign on Washington Street west of Knight Street. And so we asked that they continue to work with the city engineer. After this approval, um, they have submitted uh, an administrative subdivision application to merge the lots. And so that will happen to prior, prior to final plan approval. And there was one more condition I think got cut off, which is that we ask that you delegate the processing of the final plan to DPD staff. So based on that, we would recommend that you approve the final plan. 
Okay, thank you, Troyon. Just mark, marking down that fifth suggestion for our motion. Um, all right, so with that, uh, this is a public hearing. We will open it up to public comment. Is there anyone in the room today who would like to comment on this matter? I think we have anyone on the sign-up sheet for it. No, we don't. All right, and if you're in our virtual world, uh, please, at the bottom of your screen, please raise your virtual hand or press star nine if you're calling in. And uh, we're seeing none. So with that, we will uh, close the public comment portion of this agenda item and uh, continue on to deliberations. I mean, I think, I think we've done what, what, what we, uh, we set out to do uh, on this one. Uh, it's a much improved project um, from where it started to where it's ended up um, in no small part to the, the collaboration with the applicant and, and us. Um, so again, I, I, I think this is, considering this is something I'm gonna have to see every day when I enter my house or leave my house, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's much improved. So I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that. Commissioners, any, any thoughts? I think it would be time for a motion if, if not. What is the stop bar and stop sign on Washington Street? Is that on Ninth Street stop? To Ninth to Street and Washington Street. Um, it was the suggestion of the traffic engineer. To add a stop sign. Stop sign and stop bar, yeah. Just a, a painted line uh, on the street and a stop sign. On Ninth Street. No, on, 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 on so Washington, the, the vehicles will exit from the parking garage onto that little oh, stub that. end of Washington Street and then turn towards night. And so I think what what they're suggesting is is having you Washington. know like it's basically like that between this parcel and where that little like auto body place is. I right behind remember it. the street went across the street. Yeah, yeah, the yeah it, it ends right there. No further comments. I'm happy to make uh, a motion that we approve the final plan based on what we heard today, subjects to the conditions of the staff report. And there was one more, right? Yeah, the fifth was to delegate the processing of the final plan to DPD staff. Certainly. I'd like to add that. <laughs> Thank you. So we have a motion. Uh, do we have a second? Second. All right. We have a second. Uh, we'll go around and we'll take a vote. Manuel? Hi. Miguel? Aye. Noel. Aye. Harry. Aye. Nicole. Aye. And I vote aye. Thank you all very Good much. Good luck and let's get shovels in the ground. Let's do it. Right. Don't go anywhere, Eric. <laughs> Aren't you up next? I am. Um, he's just repositioning. All right, so we'll, we'll move on to our next agenda item, which is agenda item number four. It's a major land development project, a public hearing for case number 22-049MA. Uh, it's 386 Atwells Avenue. The applicant is 8 Hewitt Street, LLC. Um, it looks like uh, Eric's coming back, but with a, with a team this time. Uh, who, who's going to do this presentation? Is it Dan? Okay, so I'll, I'll promote you. Commissioners, I can just provide an introduction. Please while do, we wait. On. Thank you. So this, this is a request for a combination of the master and preliminary plan for construction of a four-story mixed-use building with commercial on the ground floor and a total of 21 units on the three upper stories. The proposed building will be physically connected to 8 Hewitt Street to the rear. And they are also asking for a height adjustment of five feet, where this is in the C1 zone and a height of 45 feet is allowed. And, uh, and they're asking for a proposed height of 50 feet. They are also asking for a waiver from submission of all state approvals at the preliminary plan stage. So I guess when the applicant's ready, they can tell you about the breakdown of the project, how it relates to the surroundings as well as the adjacent building. Good evening, Joelle Rocha, attorney for the applicant. I have with me uh, Joseph Sally, uh, project engineer, and Eric Suena, uh, project architect. 
Um, as Choyon said, we're here um, for the 368 Atwell's uh, portion of this. Um, the 10 Hewitt building is already constructed, constructed and fully occupied. Um, so one commercial unit on the ground floor, 21 residential units above, uh, mix of one and two bedrooms. And uh, just to highlight before I turn it over to the professionals you actually want to hear from, um, <laughs> we are asking to combine uh, master and preliminary. We've submitted all requirements for both stages. Um, the only items of note on my end are that dimensional adjustment that Choyon mentioned uh, of five feet and we're eligible for that uh, because of the mixed use nature of the property and because we're over 50% residential. Um, the waiver for submission of state approvals, I don't think we need. I think we talked um, to staff and it's only the NBC approval, not DEM or DOT. Um, so that's just the sewer connection approval. So I don't believe you have to vote on that waiver tonight, um, but we did submit it before we had our staff meeting out of an abundance of caution and it was advertised. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to the professionals to give you a rundown of the project. Sure. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman. Just for the record, my name's Joe Casali. I'm a registered professional engineer with offices at 300 Post Road in Warwick. Obviously, to my left, Eric Zwena, CDS, Architecture and Interiors. Um, if I may, Mr. Chairman, just quickly go through the presentation. Um, you all are familiar where we are in the city, uh, Knight, Atwell's, Hewitt, and respectfully, this is the subject parcel, Assessor's Plat 28, Lot 1073. It's a small piece, um, slightly less than 5,000 square feet entirely in your C1 neighborhood commercial district. Um, there is an existing 24 unit apartment building uh, alongside on 8 Hewitt Street, which will come into play in a second. Um, it's the applicant's proposal, Mr. Chairman, to raise the existing mixed use building that exists on Lot 1073. Um, and create an administrative subdivision or file for an administrative subdivision, pushing that property line, as you see, to the south or to the uh, north face of the existing building. Um, cognizant of the zero to five foot build to zone, the proposal would be a four story, uh, 4,850 square foot um, in terms of footprint, mixed use building, as attorney Roper said, um, uh, 2,100 or 2,200 square feet of commercial space on the first floor, and then the 21 residential units on floors two, three, and four. Um, we're also proposing a lobby um, that will be able to access both of the buildings at um, 8 Hewitt, uh, as well as 386 Atwells uh, from, from the same lobby. Uh, primarily that we want that to be the entrance uh, to the new building right off of Hewitt. We also have a secondary access via a residential stairwell um, off of Hewitt. And then uh, the main entrance to the commercial piece, it's the intent that that'll be off of Atwell's. Um, the floor plans will make it make sense, I hope. Um, but that is a rendering Eric's office has done. Um, I think it's beautiful in terms of the makeup and the materials. Um, you can see that on the first level, the program is primarily that commercial tenant um, with the access on Apples Avenue. The rest of that space is intended for mechanical and then uh, bike storage. We have an abundance of, uh, of bicycle spots for this uh, proposal. And that's the residential lobby that's going to be an infill with a Hewitt. Um, and the importance for us is it'll have an elevator um, accessible to all floors. Um, so in terms of program, um, floors two, three, and four are very similar in that we have six one-bedroom units and a two-bed unit on floors two and three. Um, we also have some fire doors that'll be accessible um, and then possible interior renovations under a separate applications for uh, a Hewitt. And then the fourth level plan two is relatively similar only uh, you would have a balcony um, at that fourth floor. Um, and that's where you would see that balcony over there uh, rather than some of the infill. Um, so that is the elevation of uh, the northern side of the building that we're proposing, the existing eight Hewitt, as well as the lobby, the secondary access to the stairwell, and then all the commercial space with its access up front. Um, in terms of, of parking, 
Um, as you know, Mr. Chairman, none is required in this zone based on the size of the lot. Um, same for commercial because the size of the commercial is less than 2,500 square feet. Um, in terms of loading, uh, the same because the lot is smaller than the 20,000 square feet. Uh, commercial loading is not required. In terms of bike spaces, um, five by code, uh, one for every five units, we're actually proposing and have room for 24 spaces there, uh, which is a nice amenity. Um, respectfully, in terms of utilities, the existing dumpster at Hewitt um, complex will be utilized. Um, we, in terms of landscaping, we have an existing street tree that exists now. Um, we have coordination with the city forester, but that will count as our 15% of lot coverage. Um, water, uh, pretty straightforward. You've got um, services on both Atwells and Hewitt. Um, we'll take the domestic and fire protection off of Hewitt and uh, fortunate enough to have a fire hydrant right outside uh, the facility. Um, in terms of sewer, as attorney Roca said, this is a, um, this is not a CSO. This is just a, um, this is just a sewer application that our domestic sewer will go into the Bay Commission line. Um, and then in terms of drainage, we do have a separate city owned system right outside that will be able to tie all the roof leaders in. Gas and electric is there. Um, one exception would be the existing transformer and the switch gear that currently services that existing building. Um, we're gonna build upon that. Um, photometrics are in order with the Doc Sky compliant lighting. And then in terms of where we, where we are, as Joel said, combined master preliminary uh, dimensional adjustment we're asking for for height of 45 feet is, is allowed. We're asking for 50, which is uh, five additional feet. Um, and then we still have uh, a little ways to go in terms of coordination with the city engineer, traffic, and forester, um, the Bay Commission as mentioned, and uh, province water um, and final plan possibly delegated to your, uh, your staff. Uh, Eric and I would be happy to answer questions, Mr. Chairman, of you or members of the board. Before, before we uh, I give the mic back to you folks, if I could just jump in and, and point out a couple of things that I think are important. Um, the, the first item is, unfortunately, it looks like that the title sheet of this presentation did not get updated because we had a pre-app meeting where we discussed uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Hewitt facade. The Hewitt facade was something that had a long, see, if you go to the rendering, the first page, Take your time. Yeah. That long brick wall there going up Hewitt, uh, we, that was the bike storage room. We wanted to get some windows in there. So you'll see the elevations. They have clear story windows just to break up that elevation. But before we even get there, I just want to point out that this, this project did present us as a studio a little bit of a design challenge because we had to uh, really pay attention to what was previously built at a time where we had no idea that we were going to be uh, bringing a, a structure to a commercial corridor. And so when we, when we designed and we constructed a Hewitt Street, we were thinking uh, uh, more residential in scale and we were thinking more residential in finish. And I actually brought, just for everyone's information and context, a picture of the built building at a Hewitt. This is what's there today. Um, and, and I think it's important because, you know, we didn't, it was, it was, we insisted that we looked at this building as a whole and we didn't just, thanks, we didn't just tack on a new structure that came to the um, commercial corridor of Atwells Avenue. Um, so, and, and actually it led us to one of our dimensional uh, adjustments that we're requesting, which is the 50 feet uh, from average grade, not the 45, which is our max height uh, in this district, because we are trying to align the horizontal datums of the existing structure and bringing those to the street. So as Hewitt slopes down to Atwell's, um, we wanted the roof line to continue be, be, to be continuous as a horizontal datum. And that made the building taller when you came, when you had average grade, number one. Number two, we, we insisted to remove the stacked stone from a Hewitt and move to a brick veneer because we knew that the facade at Atwell's needed something a little, with a little bit more prominence. So you'll notice in elevation, and even this rendering does imply or, or, or convey that we're talking about a brick veneer all the way up to four stories on the nose of this building, along with this anchor uh, over a very, very small uh, commercial tenant. 
The other challenge was that the main entry of the residential dwellings will be at Hewitt, at the existing residential entry. So how were we going to tie the new building that came to the commercial corridor to the existing structure? And how were we going to mark the arrival experience for, the, for both sides, for both the existing building and the new building at the same time? Um, so we feel like we did that. Uh, we, we have a secondary entry uh, or exit egress on Hewitt, but we are still leveraging the main arrival experience there. Uh, above it, we're infilling that area and using the same uh, decorative cement panel uh, products that we're using at the nose of the building on Atwell. So there'll be, a re there'll be a common language between that arrival experience and this anchor uh, at the corner of Hewitt and Atwell. And then when you look at the elevation, maybe if we could skip to the front elevation, if that's possible you'll see that we're now talking about a, a organization of, of what we would consider a, an elevated finished pallet, which is the brick veneer uh, with some soldier coursing and horizontal datums that we'll continue to articulate as we move forward through documentation and also uh, using that uh, corner as an opportunity to really uh, hold, anchor the building at the corner of, two pro of, of Atwell's and Hewitt, which is the secondary street. Um, the, um, the clear story windows were added in the bike storage room because we wanted to break up that linear uh, uh, solid facade. And uh, we also spent a little time discussing in the pre-approval um, meeting about the, um, the overhang and how this would be treated as a bay on the corner and not something that would, um, that, that would be permitted as overhanging our property line on this corner. Uh, and so I just wanted to add a little bit of context on those items from a, a design um, uh, standpoint and, and now happy to uh, answer any questions. And thank you very much, Eric. You, uh, you actually answered one of my questions, which was about the height, because it looked like you were matching the height from the rear mm -hmm. parcel. And um, I just assumed the way the grading worked is that you had the extra height um, on this front building because of the grading and, and how you take the measurements. Um, it looks like uh, going back to the existing building, where, what are the windows uh, on 8 Hewitt Street right now that face Atwell's? What are those in relation to? Are those in a stairwell or are those in a residence unit? No, uh, I, I actually brought some drawings just in case I had questions similar to this. Those, those windows are in the corridor. They're in a corridor? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, and then uh, the windows on, on Hewitt here's, Street. Here's, again, the picture. Yeah, that, that's the one yeah, I, so that's I noticed. That's basically where the fire doors will be that will take you down the corridor of the new uh, residential uh, double loaded corridor. Okay, perfect. Um, the transparency on Hewitt is, is definitely appreciated. Um, in fact, I'd, I'd almost see if, if you can incorporate any more uh, to that bike storage area. I know you probably don't want too much visibility in there, but. Um, if, if there's any way to enlarge those in, in any way, it's it's not a very pedestrian frequented street, but um, it may become one uh, if you have, you know, 40 some units being occupied here. Um, it looks like the unit mix is 18 one bedrooms and three two bedrooms. Is that correct? Yes. And is that similar to the unit mix uh, at 8, 8 Hewitt Street? Um, if you recall, I know it's not. I have it right in front of me. Um, so that no, the uh, eight Hewitt Street is all one bedrooms. All one bedrooms. <laughs> so that Fred, that uh, corner was an opportunity for us to create a two bedroom, which I think will be uh, a really nice unit. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll pass it along to the other commissioners for questions of the applicant. Um, I I have a question. So so the the existing property line remains, and there's a second means of egress. However, that depends on crossing that uh, property line. I, I guess I, I've not encountered that. In fact, the last time I did, I, it wasn't allowed as a second <laughs> mean of egress. So I, I'm curious about how that works in this project. Yeah, so we, um, we spoke to the um, fire department already on this. Um, and uh, their initial thought, I guess, how they usually deal with it is they do a, we do a cross easement for egress. Um, this is the same ownership, so you can't do an easement. So we've submitted a letter um, to the file that they've accepted. Um, 
that just says if the properties are ever sold separately, which I don't envision, that there would be a second means of egress for that front building constructed and the utilities would be separated and or an easement would be put on record for that for those utilities and egress. They were okay with that. Is there a reason um, if it's the same ownership uh, that the, the lots are not going to be merged at some later date? They, yeah, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be merged because this, then this would be considered one project. And they'd, <clears throat> they'd have a parking requirement. Oh, uh, yeah. tricky. See, you cut yourself short. We like attorneys here. <laughs> you don't have to rush off so quickly. We, we bring you back to ask questions. I, to, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I guess not likely not within our jurisdiction, but I find that I find it highly unusual. I think it's problematic for the future of this property. And I think it also depends on an operational uh, function like that, that door uh, between those is not even swinging in the right direction, which may have a reason. Uh, I, I mean, there's probably a reason uh, that that door apparently is on hold open, but uh, does not swing in the right direction. So in the event that that is not kept up, you have a trap there. I mean, I, I, I guess I, I, I have some concern about this. And again, it's not our our role and jurisdiction, but I, I just wonder if this makes more sense if it was one property. How, how do we look at this, Bob, when, when the building and, and the fire officials are gonna have to sign off on this to, to get a permit? Yeah, uh, so so this is, yeah, this is, this is a very creative uh, uh, way of, of developing this in a way that, that it's, it's two separate buildings, but taking advantage of the, the circulation system, uh, sharing, sharing the circulation system. As long as there's a, there's a property line uh, between them and that there's, there's fire rating on, on, the, the, on that property line, my understanding is that, is that the building code allows that to happen. And then I would have to defer to um, fire and building as to how, um, how egress works and, and whether it can, uh, you know, whether it can be approved, they seem to have assurances that it can be. I assume both buildings are fully sprinklered. Windows will be large enough to, for uh, emergency, not egress, but uh, escape. Yes, yeah, our services are all large enough to allow for this addition to take place. So we'll be leveraging existing services for uh, besides what uh, Mr. Casale. So you'll even have on. like utilities from AQ it be piped into this lot. That's correct. Well, that's interesting. So just out of curiosity, why is that door not? Yeah, I, thanks for bringing it up. I think this is something that I'll need to go back and talk to the team about. I, you're right. I would be less be, disturbed by it if, yeah, well, if that door, know, door swung into the stairwell. Yeah, clearly <laughs> see how that door could easily, you know, push in yeah, and then yeah, swing yeah. out. It's just yeah. a, and there's some notes that are cut off that you can see the arrows and there's like a little hatched area, which leads me to believe that there's a story behind that. And that, that might uh, be some summaries with the fire department already. So a uh, great uh, point. It does say uh, a yeah, two hour firewall at exterior wall. I'm, I'm yeah, looking so, at it. So, so this page and I, I don't know where this is in the package if it was submitted. It's that note, that arrow is pointing to a note that says fire door and hold open to use eight Hewitt elevator and stair for second means of egress. So however, that door would be swinging the other direction to be a sure. path of egress yeah. for yeah. the people in the new structure, yeah. but easily easily attainable uh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the hold open is one part of it, but I think like we all know, it then requires maintenance and, and the, I, I don't know why the, the door wouldn't swing the other way. So I think- No, I, I, I really do that, think it's just a, a mistake. Yeah. yeah, okay, all right. But something that we'll have plenty of time to, to clean up and refine through the, um, of a permitting process for sure. Every time someone burns something in their apartment, that hold open is going to go back until someone manually resets it and puts it back. You know, mm -hmm. it's yeah. going to stay closed. Mm -hmm. Good catch. Thanks, uh, Miguel. So when I when I read this before, I was also curious why this wasn't 
a merger of lots because um, it's like you're treating it as one building. And in today's presentation, further illustrates that. I mean, the, the only reason that you need the extra height is so that it has a seamless roof line between the two buildings. The connection um, um, of the two buildings, and it looks like it's 6,000 square feet on Hewitt. So that will make it a 10, 000, over 10,000 square feet building if they were to be combined into one. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, when, once combined, uh, the lots would be more than 10,000 square feet. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, I just find it a little strange that would, that you're doing everything in this project to make it into one building, but um, avoiding this being merged as one. Um, and I don't think I've, I've seen, my tenure, I don't think I've seen that. We've and, seen some creative things in the past creative, few months. Creative, not strange, creative. Um, like that word, and, and, I, I think that's that's what we can call it. Is yeah. that the, the applicants are getting much more creative in, in, in how to how to slice this. So. I guess in the end, there's no violation of doing or anything prohibited. No, it's a it's yeah. a it's a it's a creative way, a creative to, way. Uh, to present yeah. this. Yeah, well, it's 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 you know we're we're confident mm -hmm. that we can protect everyone in the building with egress and you know have the fire department support. So that that is the, the critical portion of the conversation for us and so from a, you know, we we want to create density we know that at wells is a commercial corridor you know we want people to you know we don't want to design asphalt parking lots we want to create that density in these in these urban cores so you know again we didn't design eight you at thinking that at this at wells corner was going to, going to become available to us so it was a creative challenge but we feel like we so we spent enough time sorting through all the, the critical pieces of it yeah and just to, to further that when a Hewitt, when these lots were purchased, um, they gutted the units at Atwell's at the same time they were doing a Hewitt and had tenants in Atwell's. Um, I, I think what happened is our clients who have done a number of developments, I don't know that they, they expected obviously it to be successful, but these units are selling out before the construction is done. Um, so there, I don't think they anticipated the demand that there would be, um, and this is the last project either, even though I think a year ago, they probably thought this is the last project. And so, um, I think it's just a demand issue. Mm -hmm. Here we are. I, I, I don't know. I, I guess Mike, and we, we've talked about precedents and that our approvals doesn't necessarily, um, necessarily create one, but. I'm just thinking this can open the door where people decide to connect buildings and stay within certain limits so that they can circumvent certain requirements and you know take five, three deckers and just connect them all. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure uh, how to feel about that, but that's that's my main concern here, especially because it's being treated like so explicitly being treated to create a one building, but not be one building. I, I, I can appreciate your feeling. Just I, it complies with all the regulations, right? so I. Yeah. But I, I Creative capital. Creative yeah. capital. Capital C. Creative. I digress. Then yeah. pass it along to okay. uh, Noel. <laughs> yeah, Noel, you do you have anything for the applicant? Not right yet. Okay, <laughs> Harry. No. <laughs> Nicole. No. Can, all right. Can I follow up? On yes, that? absolutely. I. Uh, not now I got into the whole uh, circulation thing. Is there a basement? There is a basement in, a partial basement in Hewitt. In Hewitt. In a Hewitt. Uh, no basement in the new structure. So so those stairs and that, and that ground level plan, it looks like you do have stairs. Well, right under that, that uh, yeah. So you have some stairs that, that there go down. Correct. Okay. To that's the Yeah. To to just a unfinished partial basement. But, but is that is that built? It's built. That is built. That's on the A Hewitt parcel, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah everything not colored is per, is already constructed. Okay. Um. That also seems like that there's a there's a chance that you could run down those stairs by mistake. Is, is that, am I reading that correctly? As a means of egress? Oh, yeah, if you're coming down those stairs. No, the door, the door is taking you to the basement. Again, I, 
just oh, okay, okay. Ironically, got it, I, I got brought it. the okay. uh, AQ plant with me, but, but so the door is, is going down. Issues. Okay, door goes down. got it. And I assume there's okay. there's a sign that says not an exit or something yeah, along right. those I, lines. I can confirm that for you with this board. Yeah, great. Thank you. I can't confirm that tonight. Yeah. Understood. Any other questions for the applicant before we hear the staff report? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, we will hear the staff report and uh, listen to some public comment. Thanks, um, Mr. Chair. And based on the applicant's presentation, we find that this will, that the design that they're proposing conforms to the requirements of the C1 zone. And this is a C1 zone where you have mixed residential and commercial development permitted by right. And they, as far as the landscaping goes, there is an existing tree that they will be preserving, which will meet their canopy coverage requirement. They have submitted an erosion control plan, and this development will not trigger the city stormwater ordinance. As far as parking goes, the building is on a lot of less than 10,000 square feet. They won't require parking. However, they will be providing bike storage, which will more than meet their bike parking requirement. They will meet the lighting and illumination regulations, and they did speak about their dimensional adjustment, and we, re and we recommend that you grant that, finding that it is required due to the, due to the topography of the site, the need, to, the need to conform with the development at A. Hewitt Street. And also, they are, this is something that they can avail of, given that they are providing mixed-use development. And finding that they have submitted all the materials that are required for the master and preliminary plan stages, we recommend that you combine the master and preliminary plan approvals. So based on that, we do find that this is in conformance with the comprehensive plan, especially as this is coincident with the neighborhood commercial mixed use development land use designation of the future land use map. And this will, this will be in conformance with objective H2 of the plan, which encourages creation of new housing. And also, it, as discussed, it, it is in compliance with the zoning ordinance, the development as has been presented in front of you. We don't foresee a negative environmental impact. They will, they will require an administrative subdivision as discussed. And we ask that they submit that prior to a final plan approval. You have adequate pedestrian access provided from Atwell's Ave at Hewitt Street. So based on that, we would recommend that you vote to combine review of the master and preliminary plan stages, that you grant the five foot height adjustment, and that you approve the master and preliminary plan stages subject to the following conditions. The applicant shall obtain encroachment permits prior to submitting for building permits, and that final plan approval be delegated to a DPD staff. Thank you, Choyon. Uh, this is a public hearing, so we will open this up to public comment. Is there anyone here in the room? If you're joining us virtually and you'd like to uh, say something, go ahead and start the uh, looking for that virtual hand down below or press star nine if you're calling in. Uh, looking around the room here, and I don't see anyone and there's no one on our sign-in sheet. But it looks like we do have someone from the uh, virtual audience. We'll promote them now. Okay, Eric Shine. Okay, Eric, when you're uh, you're you're here, can you unmute yourself? You you want to start your video? You're welcome to do yeah. that as well. Hello everyone. Um, uh, my name is Eric Shine. Um, I'm actually a resident on Hewitt Street. I live in 15 Hewitt, but I'm also the property owner for 15 and 17 Hewitt. So I just wanted to uh, just thank you guys for taking time to listen to my public comment here. But the uh, I just want to say the you know the renderings and stuff in this building is really nice. And you know I don't know how much weight you know what I have to say is going to change the development. And you know I don't foresee like you know development not happening. But you know 
living here has been a different experience than you know what it might seem with you know building these buildings and stuff like that because i bought this property in uh 2020 um and you know a few months later with, there was very little communication from the developer or the city or anything like that you know i just woke up the next morning to the lot across the street being demolished and you know a new building being brought up and so you know been multiple times um, you know, throughout that development process, even now, since the building is fully rented, um, I have very, you guys have said that there's no parking requirements now, I guess, for the building, but right now you can't even get up on the street. It's impossible. And, um, I actually had a fire emergency at my rental unit here and the fire department had a very, very tough time getting up to my house to rescue my tenants who were stuck in their house. Um, and so like, you can barely even go up on the street. So I just feel like before things are approved or any of that, I would like, you know, maybe some more thought and consideration of how this development is being done to make sure that, you know, we make sure that, you know, any emergency access to the people who live on this street can still be available. I know that there's my neighbor has a handicapped spot and, and a very elderly woman who needs medical care. And, you know, they had hard times just trying to, you know, get her medical attention either from, when the city would be tearing up the road to put in, you know, utilities or whatever without giving any notice to the residents, um, you know, for the water line or the gas line, you know, the, the list goes on. So, you know, I, it's just very concerning about like, you know, I, I don't think foresee like this development happening, but I just would like, you know, better communication from the city, better communication from the developer, but what's happening on the street, because, you know, as residents, it went from, you know, four units to now having, up to 41 people being on this very, very small street that's one way, you know? Um, so, and also too, with the thoughtfulness of the design, I live right next to, to those trash cans and it's not the greatest anymore. Now there's rats and everything now that, that weren't there before when I lived there. So, you know, I feel like, you know, maybe more input should have been taken in from the residents who actually live on the street or something like that, but, you know, I kind of just wanted to come here to this meeting just to, you know, give my two cents. And if there's any questions for me, just please let me know. But, um, you know, it's just been uh, the reality of the situation of this development is different from what it might appear to be, you know, just looking at uh, renderings and pictures and talking about it, you know. So I just wanted to bring that to you guys' attention. Um, so is there anything Thank else you. I have to say? But um, yeah, basically the things I'm looking for, just communication from the developer in the city. The parking thing is ridiculous. It's I can't even get out of my house sometimes. Um, and then you know, with the trash, I live right next to it, and there's rats and everything now. So it's not it's not pleasant. It's not good for the city. It's not good for anybody living there. So okay, thank you very much for your comments. Yeah, appreciate that. And um, yeah, I, I'm I'm all set now. <laughs> thank you. Is there anyone else in the virtual world who? Uh would like to comment on this agenda item. Again, we're on agenda item number four, 386 at Wells Ave. Not seeing anybody else. Okay. With that, we will close the public comment portion of this agenda item. I um, guess I'll ask the applicant to uh, answer, I guess, a few questions from the, from the one. Um, uh, first off, um, do, do you have a communication uh, with your tenants, I mean, I guess maybe this is a Joelle question, um, as far as, you know, parking requirements, uh, where they can park, where they can't park, things like that, because you're not providing any parking. I, I asked this question earlier, have you, uh, the question I asked earlier to the, the owner was, have you had any problems renting because of parking? I always ask that question, for example, at events, and they said no, and I said, do you make sure you tell them? Obviously, we're not providing parking. Whether the conversation goes beyond that as to where they then can park, I don't know the answer to that question, but it's on my list of laundry lists that I just took down. Um, you know, even outside of what's before this board, obviously, um, none of that, if, if that is the case, is good for the current, the current tenants at Hewitt, too, to retain them. So um, that's all, those are all issues that I'm. Yeah, I think we I think we'd like to see something in like the tenant handbook or something that that states, you know, if if this is there's no parking on this side of the street, that they shouldn't be trying to because I know tenants can be a, a bit opportunistic when it comes to uh, finding a free space to park. Yeah, I mean we can easily circulate a flyer mm -hmm. too. 
Okay. Uh, to all the tenants and all that stuff. As far as the utility work, um, you're bringing most of the utilities in, so I'm assuming all that disruption is probably done now because you're just going to have reconstructing this this other building. Is that is that correct, Joe? So yes, the utilities, um, the domestic and fire protection services, as well as the sewer service, but the main lines are already within um, the roadways. Okay. Bay Commission has a line as well as Providence Road. So they're in Hewitt Street. So you'll be digging up Hewitt Street again for the services. Yes. Okay. Um, I assume you're going to hire a GC or or someone to oversee the construction of this project. We have our own GC. Yep. Okay. So so maybe that GC can be the conduit to the neighbors and yes. make sure they communicate with. The other there's there's not many other houses on this street as i Correct. believe you know right. they they can probably just give a heads up that you know tomorrow the street is going to be impacted or for the next three days we'll right. be working on this or and that my notes were to provide a contact person perfect to those um trash cans i mean I, i'd like to believe that there weren't rats there before but uh yeah, I, I, I live a couple blocks you know on off westminster street and I have rats too, so just living in the city. Uh, do you, I, I assume you have pest control? I'm, I'm a, yes, I'm positive they have pest control, um, but also a note on, on there. Um, maybe, maybe they should up that service yes. a few times yes. a week, yep. a month. Mr. Mr. Chair, yes. uh, I'm not sure about this, but it looks like there is a, there's a lot uh, uh, on the west side of Hewitt Street that's owned by 8 Hewitt Street LLC, which I think is the applicant here. Uh, it's a small lot, 1,650 square feet vacant. I'm wondering if that's where they're they're putting their trash. Is the, do you know if that's the case? Because he, uh, the, the commenter said he lives, he lives uh, adjacent to, to the that, trash. That's the, that's the transformer. That's um, the transformer. That they at 11 in Hewitt Street? At that, at that adjacent yeah. property. Um, so it's just on the south side of the building. On the south side of the building, I see. Okay. Okay. So maybe they, there could be a little maintenance plan with the, the owners as well, making sure they maintain their lots. Um, if there's a maintenance person on site or something like that to make sure they, they adequately maintain the right. street. And while we have the, the applicant up, any other comments, questions for the applicant before we let them go? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I think um, we might be able to add some more uh, recommendations and if we were to, uh, to continue this on I, I don't know what your thoughts are but but i think you know having clear communication with the tenants about parking um making sure that the gc uh communicates all, all road work that would impact at others on hewitt street um and uh overall maintenance of their their parcels i don't think we can make that a condition of approval but uh we can strongly suggest that they take that as a priority. Um, those, those are those are my my thoughts. We're going to have to take a few votes on this tonight because we have we have a couple matters to uh, to uh, to look at. Can I just make one comment just for clarity's sake, not to discredit the testimony that, that was provided, mm -hmm. but Hewitt Street, as we know, it is a two way street. Um, it's a dead end that has two way traffic and you know, we, we spent good time discussing this project with the fire department. So we would think that if there was any huge issues with getting medical attention to anybody, that it would have came up in those meetings. So just want to go on record and say that. It sounded like maybe vehicles parking, blocking access or utility work. That's that's what I heard from the, the Again, just to testimony. clarify a few details. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you, Eric. So, but... <clears throat> Miguel brings up a good point. So, um, I mean, if if someone says we have two lots and we're going to combine them as one building, but we're going to continue to call it separate, 
so we get around parking. Does that begin to become a problem? I mean, you know, even on Gano Street. Well, I was they, thinking of that yeah, case in point. Gano Street, they creatively kept five lots until the. Not with regard to this project, but but as a bigger question, that's a, that's a real question. I think somebody can just start saying, "Let's just buy adjacent lots," and uh, in fact, combine them, but not really combine them. I mean, I think it's I think it's an issue. Well, uh, I I certainly hear what you're saying. Um, you know, we do have a policy uh, where we, you know, in commercial areas on small lots, uh, we don't require parking. And, you know, we, we try to, uh, you know, send the message to developers that, that um, parking doesn't always need to be prioritized. Um, and uh, we're seeing that developers are willing to, to build units without parking because, because they have tenants that um, often don't have cars. And if they do have cars, they have to find other, other legal means to park those cars. Uh, there is a process where they could get overnight on-street uh, parking permits, but under no circumstances should anybody be uh, parking on Hewitt Street. It's not not wide enough uh, for the, there to be parking. As far as I can tell, uh, it is no parking. Although, uh, as I'm looking at at um, the street view, I'm not seeing those no parking signs. I'm not seeing any parking signs. That might be so, uh, that might be uh, a recommendation to to alert the parking administrator about that. Um, but I don't I don't know that. I mean I I, I guess. I feel like you know the, the city is moving towards a place where we don't necessarily uh, make it a high priority to provide to to, to uh, require the private developers to provide uh, as much parking as the market will demand. You know, keep in mind the more parking uh, we we have off street, the more traffic that's going to mean on the roads. And you know, ideally, what we would like to see is that a, a significant part of our population can live at the, live in the city, especially along major uh, commercial corridors without needing to have a car. And yeah, Wells is probably one of those corridors that you, you could. Listen, we manage about 900 parking spaces, I know. and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess, I guess the, the extension though is, is the, is the precedent where we we approve projects that are kind of that don't work except by virtue of being next to another property which which is enabling their use like i, I mean this is no small thing egress right like this is the second means of egress to to this building so it, i mean i i i think it's a interesting thing to to grapple with even in terms of of the precedent of like do do all the pieces of the building have to be on the lot for it to be approvable i would say i would think yes but i guess we're about to say maybe not to me it looks like an addition to a <laughs> right. separate building there's no i mean we're using there's in the elevator using the entrance um, without that, and then in the future, <clears throat> that was brought up earlier. If the property is sold, it'll have to be sold as one. But you know, we've been around long enough to see the title issues make fake make buildings vacant after the original owners decide they don't want to do it anymore. If I if I can just state this, um, your job is to find <laughs> conformance with the zoning ordinance. Um, and you know the 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 and the comp plan, but but your job, one of your jobs, is to find conformance with the zoning ordinance. Um, you can make that you can make that call. Our zoning official 
has looked at this and said that she believes that it complies with the zoning ordinance. She's not the final decision on this. You are. We write regulations. Uh, we think we know what we're going to get from these regulations. Uh, developers are very creative. Lawyers are very creative. Uh, you know, you you often don't see um, attempts at the most creative uh, types of developments because we tell them, no, that's not going to work <laughs> under any circumstances. Um, and and you know, like you say with Gano Street, uh, we do allow for subdivisions to create lots of under ten thousand square feet for freestanding buildings that don't require parking. This takes that concept to another level. They are uh, now, what would be the consequence? If you, if you said no to this, that you don't think that it complies with zoning because you don't think it's two separate buildings, for example, you can interpret, you know, you can read the ordinance and you can see, you know, what it says. If you feel like you can find a hook to say that it, that it doesn't comply, the developer could come back and build a building that looks just like this, except they'd have to put another elevator in. And they'd have and to put another, and, and yeah. they'd have to put in another stairwell, but they could build another building connected by it. That's clear. Uh, there's no no question. It, it should be no question in anybody's mind that they could up, put up another building with a party wall um, that that uh, that has no communication whatsoever with the existing building, but they would have to meet the the fire code and the building code. This is a way of complying with zoning. In a way, it's 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 almost more a, a, a creative uh, interpretation of fire and, and building codes. Mm -hmm. But again, they they have you know done their due diligence and they've talked to uh, officials in the fire department and the and the building department. So, um, but that but again, it's it's your purview to make that yeah, call. No, I don't I don't I, I'm not really challenging this. I'm looking, I'm just thinking about, and I don't want to belabor this, but you remember we were talking about a law that was passed that either combined vacant lots or, or brought yes. vacant lots together. Yes, undersized. Now yeah. you've got 5,000 lot problem on your hand because there just wasn't the proof for house. And I just think that what Miguel said was right. Somebody could say, okay, this is two buildings, it's three, it's four, it's five. And then someone sells one, and then someone else goes bankrupt, and suddenly you just find that you've got these five, in a sense, almost townhouses that are under different ownership, even though and they're all kind of somehow it's collapsing. Uh, you know, so I, I, I should be the change. Like I, I point that the solution would be to change something in the zoning, not to deny this application. That's right. That's yeah, right. I, I, I actually. That's I'm, what I'm getting at. I'm not all that upset at this. I think it's, I, I'm actually when when someone comes before us with with a proposal like this, I, I'm more intrigued and and I want to know how they got there. And I'm I'm actually I'm jealous. I didn't think about it first. Like this is this is a really savvy way to to to, to dice it and uh, and it works. Um, if I mean the biggest hurdle I think is not us. It's it's the fire marshal. It's, if if he can sign off on it and get comfortable with it. I mean, as far as I can say, I, uh, I, that's, that's fine by me. I, I, one thing I don't understand, I think I heard them saying they can't grant an easement to themselves. No, it's a common ownership. It's a, well, actually, Joel can. So can't there, be, but, but couldn't there be something recorded against the deed for, for, for each, each of these lots? You could do an that, access agreement, I believe, but not an easement. Is that correct? Yourself, it, it just gets, I think it gets a little awkward um, as to what, what I'm sure we, I'm sure I can come up with something. Uh, fire just wanted the, the letter signed by the property owner, and it, it just to clarify, it said, and I'm sure I have that, but I have it too. So it says, um, uh, 
you agree that the properties will not be sold separately in the future, but if they are, either one is fully placed in the property to be memorialized. I'm sorry, wait a minute. Sorry. But if they speak are into the, one, speak into the mic, please, Joel. Um, it's if uh, properties shall not be sold separately in the future, but if they are either one, easements will be placed on the properties to memorialize the shared ingress, egress, and utilities at the time of such sale, or two, a second means of egress will need to be provided for 386 at wells, and the utilities will be required to be separated if an easement is not recorded. So can that be recorded with the, the plan? Uh, Probably. I mean, I think I think that would put a lot of us at ease. I mean, I know I've, I've run into this in my, my uh, the development project I was working on where there were uh, connecting buildings that had two separate financiers and there needed to be uh, access agreements. Again, it's same common ownership um, and, and access easements uh, beneficial to both parties uh, it, laying out all maintenance and everything like that had to be recorded prior to funding of the loan. And that, that's a great point. And when we get to the financing part, which we use the same bank for all of this, um, I would hold, I would probably communicate with your solicitor and see what the bank wants. That way we're not recording a letter and then the access agreement, obviously at final plan, we'll know exactly what's going on there. But that's something beyond there. I just, I don't want to overkill it if the bank's going to say we want, just like you said, an access and maintenance agreement um, recorded. So I think that makes sense. Okay. I mean, you could make the, could you make the conditions of that letter conditions of your approval, either or? Yeah, I, I think it would be either or, either either that letter or an access agreement that, that an access and maintenance agreement reciprocal to, to both parties, both lots, because they're the same party, which is why we can't issue, have an easement recorded. Right. Would the entrance need to be redesigned? What you were saying? Well, I think it, it, it would be, it, if it is necessary, it would be caught by the, the building fire court marshal. official and, and, yeah. and fire marshal and, and reviews later. I, I don't think that should no, necessarily be a condition because it, it should happen anyway. And it looks like, it sounds like they'll be looking into it anyway. I'm comfortable with that. I, I'm, Nicole? All right. I'm thinking that we should start making some motions. Yeah, so um, the first one would be uh, if we vote to combine the review of the master and preliminary plan phases. I will make a motion. Okay. I'll second. Yeah, we have a motion on the table. Let's go around. Manuel? Aye. Miguel? Aye. Noel? Aye. Harry? Aye. Nicole? Aye. And I vote aye. And then I'll make a motion that we grant the five-pipe adjustment based on what we heard before us with the applicant and Staff. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second from Harry. We'll go around again. Manuel? Aye. Miguel? Aye. Noel? Aye. Harrison? Aye. Nicole? Aye. And I vote aye. And I will make a motion that we vote to approve the master and preliminary plan subject to the following conditions. Um, the applicant shall obtain encroachment permits prior to submitting for building permits. Final plan approval shall be delegated to DPD staff, and that um, either the letter or the access agreement be reported with the plan. Do you want to put the administrative subdivision? Sure. I'm sorry, yeah. do you want to put one? The administrative subdivision? And then yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's just the, the, the lot moving lot of the lot lines. Okay, yes. And then um, also with a recommendation to the DP or the parking administrator that uh, no parking stock, uh, signs be installed on Hewitt Street? Yes, we'll add that to the motion. Great. And, and just to be clear, the letter you're referencing is the one from the fire department. So the, the letter that she just read, the fire or, um, but it's my understanding mm -hmm. that could potentially be an access agreement that coincides with the letter. So either the letter she just read or the access agreement. Okay. And I'll second that. All right, we have a motion on the table. We'll go around. Manuel? Aye. Miguel? Aye. Noel? Aye. Harry? Aye. Nicole? Aye. And I vote aye. Again, very, very creative and savvy uh, use of our, our land use regulations and uh, 
best of luck. <laughs> um, Mr. Chair, yes, um, before we move on to another item, it's, it's related but not related to this item just occurred. Are we done, are we done with this? Well, yeah, we are. Yeah, this this, more, this, yeah, is, this yeah. is kind of awesome. How do we voice, or uh, I'm not an attorney, definitely not a land use attorney, um, but how do we address these type of concerns from our perspective? I understand that we have our purview and some things are outside of it, but I can see a lot of complications of how this could be problematic. How do we, um, as a commission, voice those concerns to zoning, um, maybe through the city plan itself or? Yeah, I think, I think the Bob and, and his team deal with a, with a lot of uh, competing interests when it comes to, to the land use overall in the city. You know, there, there's, there's the whole comprehensive plan discussions that's, that are, that are occurring now. Right. Um, and I think from that will be recommendations to, to laws, or changes to zoning and, and, and things of that nature. So I think, I think the start and Bob can correct me if I'm wrong would be uh, figuring out where we want to go with the comprehensive plan and then tailoring the, the zoning and planning changes accordingly. Yeah, even 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 independent of that, um, there are certainly some things that might come about through that comprehensive planning process that, that would result in changes to our, our policy and our and our zoning regulations. But uh, we are on a regular basis kind of monitoring the different types of developments that, that come through and seeing how well the ordinance holds up. Uh, and whether there are loopholes that we're not happy about that that um, that are being exploited, and uh, you know, just as we did with this this last round of zoning changes that's moving its way through the process, uh, we will on occasion uh, um, suggest some changes. We write those changes um, that that we'll bring to you, and then ultimately to the city council. With respect to this one, I think. Um, it, it, it's something I'm certainly going to talk with with staff about. We've had some conversations about this, and we did feel that, you know, this might raise a few eyebrows, um, you know, when it when it came in front of you. And I think it's worth a debate, uh, you know, with you to to talk about. Okay, is this is this policy good? Is it bad? Uh, should we, um, you know, for example. Uh, you could go two ways on this. You could say you could say either, um, you know, when something like this happens, we make it clear that the exemption doesn't apply if buildings are attached and, and they share egress, and it might constructively result in a lot of more than ten thousand square feet. Or maybe conversely, you might you might um, be inclined to say. That 10,000 square foot exemption is is uh, arbitrary. Why don't we raise that? You know, uh, so there are, there are lots of ways we could go with this. Yeah, I mean, it's it's we're we're dealing with you know a lot of like like I said initially competing interests where we we want more housing obviously and and we want we want density in certain areas and this is an area that that wants density. Um, so it's it's a unique situation we find ourselves in where. People are getting so creative to build the density that we're telling them we need, right. <laughs> and and still trying to do it. So the answer to your question is that I think you just voiced your concern, and Bob keeps a list. Mm -hmm. And I know that when I have issues on zoning, I I email Bob and he puts them on his list, and so does Alexis in the zoning office. And he keeps running lists of these issues. And so if you have any others, you can just send them to Bob and he'll put them on the list. And then they'll, they will at some point be discussed as we're going through the upcoming comprehensive plan and zoning ordinance changes. Unless they need to be addressed sooner, and then they will. Right, that's right. Right. Also, we answered it pretty well, I think. If, if it is sold and you have to do this and this and this and this, it's not as though we left it in a vacuum. Oh, yeah. No, we, I thought we, we crossed the T's and dotted the I's. And it's, you know, I realize it's not part of the philosophical issue, but at least it's closed. Yes. On this project. Yeah. I, I, I felt better knowing that you said Alexis looked at this and she said it's it's uh, it's complete and that it, uh, it should be heard. So 
and there, there was a, one other thing that Bob said, it, we don't hear everything that comes in, which is something we hear a lot of stuff, but uh, I, I don't, I would, I would wage to, to guess that, that there, there are many, 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 many other things we never see. <laughs> um, just, just my guess. <laughs> There's a difference between creative and scurrilous. Yes. I'll ferret all that. I'll, I'll, I'm going to borrow that term and, and <laughs> the next time I have a meeting. Um, so we've been doing this for a while. Uh, I could use a, a short break. Um, you want to? Do you want to take a, well, a few minutes? Yeah, we 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 have the, the food if you want. We can. We only have we have one more agenda item. Okay, so you want so you could you could take a five minute break. You could finish up, and then we can send you How packing. You guys with, feel? I, I don't want to. We could send you home with your food if you want. No, we, we wrap up early, or should we take some time? Share it with significant others. We, you can do that All right. too. Yeah. All right, so let's take a five minute break. It's uh, seven fourteen. We'll come back at seven twenty. So we'll take a six minute break. Uh, seven twenty.
All right, it's 7.20 uh, p.m. We're, we'll call this meeting back to order and we will move right on through uh, skipping agenda item number five because we already heard that earlier this meeting and we will go right to agenda item number six. It's an institutional master plan for women and infants hospital. The applicant is also women and infants hospital. All right, thanks, Mr. Chair. And this is the five-year renewal of the women and infants hospital institutional mm -hmm. master plan. And as the plan indicates, and as the applicant will tell you, you there aren't too many changes that have occurred since 2016. The applicant's goals, as well as the main characteristics of the hospital, including the amount of parking required, traffic generated, have remained constant since they were last before you. So you won't be seeing too many changes there. The main reason why they're before you, or one of the main components of this master plan renewal is the is an 18,000 square foot addition on their main building at Dudley Street and it will be an addition to the second floor and an extension of the labor and delivery unit so the applicant is here and they can tell you more about that in addition to the other the other components of the plan which have basically remain mostly the same since 2016. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, please introduce yourself and uh, and go right ahead with your presentation. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ed Robbins. I'm the Senior Capital Project Manager for Care New England, uh, primarily overseeing the addition to the Women and Infants facility. Um, so without further ado, I will hop directly into a presentation that I have set up. So if you could just please let me know when you can see my screen. There you go. Fantastic. All right. So um, what we're proposing, as Choyan said, is a second floor only addition to women and infants facility. So the existing campus is shown up here in the left where my cursor is hovering. There is some existing parking right here on the site that I've just kind of highlighted that we will be maintaining. And we're gonna take some nods from the South Pavilion, which was built in 2000, to create the look or finalize the image of women and infants in its main turnaround. So here you can see the, the main ballet space, the existing building, what we call the stealth bomber, you can see in the aerial, some draftsmen had fun with the shape of the building. Um, so we will we will come out from that point, uh, keeping the second floor connection. Really, the clinical reasons are paramount while we're doing a uh, why we're doing a second floor addition only. Um, it helps create or keep some of the adjacencies to the C-section room and some of the workflows that already exist in the hospital since it was built in the '80s. So one of the key important you know points of this is is why right. So women and infants has been at this site since 1985. And since that time, there has been little to no modifications to their labor and delivery. So for anyone who has or knows somebody that has been born at women and infants, they've pretty much been born in the same room as the person that delivers today. And so we really need to change that. Uh, so the addition um, is required. We've, we've already gone through, um, or it's required to meet all the current FGI guidelines. So the federal guidelines for uh, healthcare design. Um, we've gotten our approval for DOH through our CON process. We've also gotten approval. This land is owned by Lifespan, so we also had to get approval from our landlord to be able to build the addition. Uh, the zoning requirements, the, the big ones that we've kind of notified or identified is the, the heights, which we comply with the current height requirements. And we also know that parking can be tough around women and infants and Lifespan. So the good news is, is that the existing parking count that exists on that site will be maintained. It'll be modified a little bit because of our structure, but in all, there won't be any change to our parking counts um, as identified in our institutional map plan, even from 2016. Uh, so this is really just a quick plan. Again, you know, I'm gonna highlight the area where the addition is. This is just to show that we, fully plan on uh, maintaining our current parking on that site. Um, so, you know, talking a little bit more about that parking lot, that's where administration, that's where doctors park. So as we get a little bit more into the meat and the potatoes of how this will happen, 
the the real important thing to note there is that it's not going to affect our patients. It's not going to affect visitors. We have processes in place that are going to help us get through construction and without affecting you know uh, our consumers. Um, so this is just a real quick outline. We have our existing NICU building. We have the existing labor and delivery unit in the old building. You can see the connection just comes right off of that corner. I'll go to the more pretty, uh, or at least, you know, easily identifiable color coded plan. The, the purple on the outside, those are our labor and delivery rooms. They're about 500 square feet. The current ones are about 200 square feet. The current ones don't even have shared, uh, don't even have private bathrooms. Some of them are shared. None of them have access to natural light. So these are all the main fundamental reasons that we need to do this. It's the appropriate thing to do. So 20 labor and delivery rooms, just like you see here, private bathrooms, ample space for the clinical services. And then you also have uh, the baby resuscitation station, which you know needs to be within the room. So you can't have a baby delivered that then has to be taken away from mom to have clinical services provided to that baby. So, you know, having all that contained within the room is super important. And then you can see the, the core support services that support those labor and delivery rooms would be in the center with skylights and access to natural light as well. Staff quality of life is just as important as the impact on, on patient, you know, experience as well. Uh, it, it's been shown that the, the the happier staff are, the more engaged staff are, the, the better your clinical outcomes are. So it, it helped really kind of comes full circle on, on the caregivers. Burnout's real. It's something that we're dealing with today. Post-COVID is something we care about. So it's super important for us to also make sure that the staff have an appropriate location to work as well. So how are we going to make this work? Um, so again, here's the stealth bomber. You can see it shaped clearly now. There's the South Pavilion with its white roof. The green area is our main area of construction. The yellow dot identifies the turnaround space in the, in the main valet area. So on any given day, we really have enough space in that turnaround to have cars stacked along the curb and also have cars be able to pull up to the main entrance. So at least where we're going to have the construction side, we have the ability to take half of that turnaround, push the gate out, create an entrance where our construction services can get in and out, still maintain access in that main turnaround. And this is most of our process through 80% of construction. Where it's really gonna get fun is when we have to erect steel. So when we need massive amounts of lay down area, what we're gonna do is we're gonna modify our turnaround. We're gonna make it so that instead of it being one way, it'll be two ways on one entrance. That'll allow us to have the truck show up, drop off, lay down material, have the crane swing around. This way we're not having cars go through our site, around our site or anything like that. This ends up as a nice safe condition. And then we'll be able to turn the site back over into the previous slide so that when we're done with steel and we're pretty much doing build, building exterior, we can go back to a minimized impact on the site. And obviously if we have to flex up or down, we can always have coordination efforts within ourselves to say, hey, this is when we're going to be modifying our turnaround. This is, you know, how long that's going to be there. And we can self-regulate that. So the valet services are, are contracted through women and infants. They leverage W4, which is a, a large parking space. So just to get your bearings, um, the South Pavilion roof is the white one. Again, the stealth bomber. Green is our area of construction. And all these yellow uh, lots are those that are currently dedicated to women and infants. So whether it's through land leases with lifespan or through leases with other landlords, we have access to all these current yellow lots. So what we need to do really is just inherently look at ourselves and say, okay, with those parking spaces taken over while we're under construction, who's being moved? How are they being moved? and how long are they being moved for? So if we have priority parking that needs to be assessed, we'll do that internally. We can still leverage W4, which is the giant lot here that I'm gonna highlight. That's where our valet currently brings cars that have exceeded the turnarounds capacity. They go to that lot. So in this case, we'll have 20 or 30 more cars in that lot if we need to. If we find that we have issues navigating staff parking plus the valet, 
then we are going to start pushing more staff off of the typical site that we have now. The blue lot that's down here that I'm gonna highlight is a new lot that we're already in the works of and is pretty much a done deal that we're going to expand our leased parking. So we've worked with the landlord, there's 120 spots there. The orange line that you see on the presentation indicates an existing show route that we use now for staff. So the idea here is that if we need to push people off the site, it's going to be our own staff. It's not going to be patients, and it'll be our eight-hour eight hour parkers. And so they can park down at the end, leverage the existing shuttle services. We can expand those services so that we don't have a lot of contractors and other staff parking on the street during this time. Um, everyone will park in the blue lot or the yellow lots. We'll self-regulate that, as I've been saying. And that shovel service will help connect the dots for us throughout the construction process. We're expecting this to be about two years worth of construction. Hopefully, you know, being able to break ground in January. Um, and then I'll just leave it with a couple of renderings, you know, about the building. Uh, so again, uh, I, I know in the, you know, importance of time and <laughs> trying to keep it quick, but also try to cover the main salient point. So with that being said, I can turn it over for any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll uh, I'll let any of the other commissioners ask questions of the applicant. I think this looks. My, my opinion is this looks uh, like a like a well thought out uh, um, expansion. Um, I, I know all of the hurdles uh, that you have to jump through to to keep clean spaces and and hospital work is not easy. Um, so it looks like based on your, your diagrams, you're, you're, you're planning to start this year and you anticipate only about two months of that less than ideal situation um, at, the, uh, at the parking area, is that correct? Yeah, uh, I mean, Danielle, our contractor would probably hate me for saying such things. Um, we got to figure out a little bit more about the, uh, the consistency of the soils on the site, but you know, at sure. best, you know, yeah, we're, we're swinging steel for about two months and, and we're hoping that that's the, the biggest run of it. Okay. I have a, a few questions. I, I guess, uh, thank you for the presentation. I, I obviously, uh, much needed and, and really important work. I, I'm curious a little bit, uh, more about some of the uh, campus evaluation that you've done, uh, including uh, it looks like you have plans to plant some trees in the coming five years. Um, and, and I guess you're, you're kind of very thoughtful about uh, parking and shuttling uh, to parking, I, I wonder whether you've also evaluated pedestrian pathways in that area. Yes, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, it, it's tough because most people are driving in from those locations. So most of the pedestrians that we're dealing with are either parking at Lifespan's, uh, you know, parking garage or, or in one of their lots and then walking over to us. We do have the RIPTA. Uh, depot now at the base of Dudley, which has helped as well. Um, you know, we're trying to be cognizant of all of that. It's it, it's tough in this urban fabric because you're you're right. We're it, we're trying to shoehorn a whole lot into these sites as far as parking, planting, and all that other stuff. And it, it's a real delicate balance. But I guess you know to that point, we do have a bus station on Dudley Street, which I think has really truly been abandoned. But you know, just making sure that we have the ability to cover people or, you know, provide them appropriate space to, uh, you know, it, it, yeah, I guess I don't necessarily have an answer for that. We're trying to cram it all into, <laughs> into these sites. I guess, so I, I will take this opportunity to exhort uh, you uh, as I have done your counterparts uh, from Lifespan uh, to really think about your campus, not just as a collection of, of properties and individual buildings, uh, but as a campus that can contribute both to the health and wellness of your staff and your patients, but also of the community as a whole, 
uh, I, I really think that uh, healthcare institutions across the country are starting to look and understand not just that the, the point that you made, I think, and, and well said that, that, you know, happier staff means better outcomes because most of us have recognized that the built environment can have a positive effect on, on health outcomes. And that's not just in our buildings, right? That is inside and outside. And given the, the alarming rise in, in lifestyle uh, type diseases like heart disease and diabetes, we, we have an opportunity and I, and I think it, you as, uh, as the representative of this institution, which takes such good care of our health to really think about not just the reactive side of this, but the proactive side of this and, and look at the example that other hospitals are setting across the country in terms of thinking about uh, simple things like the paths that people are walking on and, and being able to take a walk outside of your uh, hospital room or, or if your partner is in that room, you know, take a break, go for a walk. And, and be able to walk because you're right, it is a very, very tough urban fabric, but guess what? It's built by you and <laughs> your partners at Lifespan. So I, I exhort you to, to kind of look at this and I hope that in the next institutional master plan, uh, we see a, a more concerted effort to take a look at this uh, in collaboration with, with Lifespan and other parties in that area. Noted. So you do that. You've been given your marching orders for the next time you're in front of us uh, from Manuel. Understood. I, I, I agree completely. I, I mean, I, my, my daughter was, was born here. Uh, actually, next week, it'll be three years ago. And um, it's, it's a wonderful facility, but, but Manuel is absolutely correct. That when I went to take a walk to, to get some fresh air, there wasn't even like a, a cafe I could go to on the weekend to, to get a bite to eat or anything. I just walked around parking lots. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a very good point. Manuel, I mean, uh, Miguel. Um, let me just echo in the same, the same um, sentiment. Um, looks like some of the greenery is gonna be, the little that there is gonna be um, eliminated so if we can, or now we, if you can find a way to add um, more of that green space, um, I'm, I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit from some of the previous testimony to you and your counterparts that a lot of concrete islands have been created um, due to the elimination of housing um, and um, you know, the change in, in the landscape uh, due to the expansion of, of these institutions, which are very important, but there's been a cost to the immediate neighborhoods uh, with the heat maps and all that. So um, if you can, you know, when you get back to the drawing board uh, to think of that, um, you know, for your, your uh, the clientele that's, that's visiting the, the hospital and to Manuel's uh, point uh, to the residents that still uh, live in the area um, to make it uh, more attractive and healthier for everyone involved. Noel, you have any? Harry? Harry, do you have anything? No, I just wanted to say that it was a wonderfully concise, thoughtful presentation. And, uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Nicole? No. All right. Um, thank you very much again. Uh, your institution does bring a, a, a great service to, to the city, and, and we do appreciate it. So with that, we'll let you go. Uh, hang on, though, so we may have questions after public comment. Um, and with that, we'll hear the staff report and we will open up public comment. So, so commissioners, as discussed, the applicants goals, objectives and other, and other components of the plan remain pretty much the same since they were last before you in 2016. Also, as far as the parking study goes, as far as the parking study goes, they did, they have submitted the traffic study with the institutional master plan that they submitted, which shows that there's, there's only about 2% increase in traffic expected, which is not, which is not, which is, which does not require further action on their part. They did note that they did, 
that they held a public virtual meeting in June 2022 that was open to the community. And other than the, the addition of the labor and delivery services, you, they aren't expected to have any other major repairs or renovations in the next five years. And anything that you will see will be internal and small in scale. And they also included a landscaping component with the plan, which says that they will be working with the city forester to meet the canopy, canopy coverage requirement for their campus. So based on that, we do find that the plan conforms to the objectives of the comprehensive plan, which requires that institutions show that there's limited, that there will be limited growth and few negative impacts on neighborhood on the surrounding neighborhood. It also follows the format prescribed by the zoning ordinance. So based on that, we would recommend that you approve the IMP subject to the condition that the applicant continues to work with the city forester to fulfill their landscaping requirements. Okay, thank you, Choyon. Um, we'll, uh, we'll take public comment at this time. We'll open up the public meeting public comment portion of this meeting. And if you're here for virtually, please raise your virtual hand or press star nine if you're calling in. And is there anyone here in the room who would like to speak? Okay, not, none in the room. And we're not seeing anyone online raise their hand either. Okay, with that, we will close the public comment portion of this agenda item. So I, I guess now my my questions are directed to uh, city plan staff, and, and I guess I, I'm curious about the the kind of five year window for these. I noticed that 2016 was the last one. It's now 2022, and it looks like we're getting an amendment. So I, I guess I'm curious just to hear a little bit about the process for. Uh, reviewing these and the and the kind of thresholds for review and, and I guess I, I say so just because I feel like uh, six years is a long time in an institution and it's and you know for cities it's not that long uh, but a lot has changed and a lot has changed in that area and and I guess I I I want to understand how we ensure that our big institutions that that are big landowners and uh, enjoy certainly some benefits from uh, being landowners in the city and uh, and also provide wonderful benefits uh, but ensuring that they are uh, doing their part to to kind of align with our comprehensive plan and meet those goals because we are approving it based on some of these goals but when you look at those goals uh, more is wanted, I, I would say, and, and I would hope that more could be done, especially uh, from these big institutions. Uh, certainly a fair question. These, uh, so we, the institutional master plans are intended to, um, to identify the, the, the projects that the institutions are gonna undertake uh, for, for a period of time. They have this five-year shelf life um, because we want them to be at least uh, updated or, or, or if nothing's changing to be, to be you know, sort of reapproved at least every five years. Uh, we don't require them to, to do anything new if they don't have any intentions to do anything new. Uh, we have had a couple of uh, these not, not too long ago that were more or less status quo plans, but they, but they need to be, um, they need to have an approval that's less than five years old in order for anything that's in that plan to be, uh, to be constructed. Uh, so if there are situations where they're really not changing anything, um, you know, they, they could come in and say, we, we want this, this plan to, to stay the same, but just be uh, um, reapproved. In this case, uh, you know, women and infants. It, it's a, it's, it's sort of an incremental approach where, uh, more or less, everything's staying the same except for this one addition that they that they want to do. 
Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes um, institutional master plans, when, when uh, e either one big project might have, uh, you know, other ramifications that, that impact not just the capital improvement section, uh, or they may come in with, you know, a, a large number of changes that they want to make. So, so uh, some of these are, uh, some institutions decide that um, it doesn't make sense to, to amend, it, it makes sense to, to sort of start from scratch. They can do that, or they could do this, this piecemeal approach. Um, you know, to your, to your points about, about their parking lots and about pedestrian circulation, um, you know, definitely, definitely uh, good points. Um, there aren't necessarily any requirements in zoning that, that speak directly to that. Perhaps that is something that, that uh, we should consider uh, when talking about, you know, um, you know, circulation, that it be not just vehicular circulation, but also uh, pedestrian and, and, um, and, you know, even bicycle circulation for that matter. We all know what the parking situation is down in that area, in that, in that the campuses of those, of those hospitals. It's not great. Um, we have over time tried to, to, you know, move the needle a little bit, especially with respect to, to landscaping. Um, whenever there is uh, a, a repaving, we tell them they need to comply with the current regulations. That often does result in a little bit better, um, uh, you know, landscaping treatment and stormwater management and things like that. Um, if they do intend simply to keep a, a parking lot as it is and don't intend to reconstruct it, even if it's non-conforming, that can continue over time. Um, but I do get your point. It is, uh, you know, there are some things that, that um, you know, when they, when they come in, when you have an opportunity to, to, to talk to them in this, in this sort of formal way, uh, perhaps there should be uh, more opportunity to try to um, advance some of these other goals. I, I, I certainly take your point. And, and to your point, I, you know, I, I think if we thought of, of even like strategically surgical ways of compelling, that your point about defining traffic as more than just vehicular, because, because when you look at, at, at this, it is, it is dominated like like much of our our <laughs> sites and cities, but uh, by by the evaluation of how vehicles move, and yet you know we're humans that don't always move around in cars. So it's set up very much like a <clears throat> suburban. Like this could be a suburban hospital, right? Like this could easily, by the way that it's described here, it could be a suburban hospital, uh, but it's not. And and I think yeah. compelling them to think about. Uh, other modes of, of movement would help a lot. It, it's, you know, it, it, this is not the first time that, that we've, we've been here with, uh, with the hospitals. Um, I, I have found that when it comes to large institutions, the colleges are much more willing to uh, discuss uh, traffic demand management, um, you know, promoting use of, of bus passes uh, by students and faculty and, and um, reducing, you know, parking demand uh, on their campuses. Uh, they've been actually really good at that, most, most of the, the colleges. Um, I'll say that the hospitals haven't. Um, healthcare in general, uh, it's not just the hospitals, it's the, it's the, the doctor's offices, uh, the community health centers, uh, we've been talking with with uh, some facilities where um, they're looking to to exceed parking maximums because their parking demand is so high. And the response we always get is um, that their facilities have enormous parking needs. And you're right that that you know this this is the kind of uh, parking and circulation that you would expect to see in a in a suburban location. Um, and it's and it has uh, eroded the urban fabric. Um, it's certainly not ideal. Uh, we did uh, at one at one point. Um, I don't know 
if this was due to our advocacy, but we certainly push for it. Uh, uh, we got Rhode Island Hospital to construct a, a, a small parking structure to at least use their land a little bit more efficiently. Um, and if it's worth anything, uh, I think we have sort of stopped the, um, the encroachment of, of the institution, uh, the erosion of the residential fabric by the institution. Of course, the damage has largely, largely been done. Um, so it is, you know, perhaps this is another one of those uh, things that we, we could um, address in the institutional master plans uh, going forward. Yeah, this is this isn't the first time something like this has come up, and and trying to figure out the levers that we can use uh, to compel institutions, you know, not just healthcare, but overall throughout the city, they 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 bring a service to us, but we also want them to, uh, you know, do their part as well. And it doesn't, at a high level, seem like you know we're approving things. There's only standards with the with the colleges and universities and healthcare. It's just so wishy washy. It's um, frustrating because there's nothing to point to it. Uh, and so I wonder if there's a way to, when we're going through changes, maybe I mean, these these were designed to be. To that's correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. <laughs> You're right because it's they're they're gray. It's kind of just they're like they're I think this was this was intended to be like a, an every so often check in with the institutions, a way to for them to talk about and for us to ask questions about what they're doing on their campuses because because it doesn't always happen otherwise. Yeah, I mean, the institutional master planning process, as as I understand it's its genesis was was uh, intended to be um, a means where the, the institutions were compelled to disclose what they planned to, to build uh, because they didn't have to do that before and there really wasn't any kind of public review of their of their projects so this is the way it's been since the i think late 1980s maybe grant knows better than i do but but uh, <laughs> um, that's my understanding and and you know, if if uh, I, I don't think this is the way it always has to be. You know, uh, we at at one point um, we kind of floated the idea of, of maybe treating large projects more like land development projects. Um, that didn't re really get a whole lot of traction uh, with the institutions. Uh, I had a question about when they buy and sell lands. Does that go into a different zoning? It doesn't know the zoning doesn't change. So if they sell, if they if they if they buy land uh, that's that's not in an institutional zone, and they're not allowed to use it for institutional purposes, um, their recourse is they can try to get the, the, the land rezoned, and that does happen from time to time. If they sell land, it stays in the institutional zone, and the buyer has has the same sorts of rights to build. Um, Healthcare or higher educational facilities, or other things that might be allowed in that institutional zone. So, you know, there there might be times when, uh, if they do divest of land and it goes into, uh, you know, private ownership, perhaps uh, that might be an opportunity for the city to change the zoning. We did that uh, to a certain degree with St. Joseph's Hospital. Uh, that that has all been actually not to a certain degree. That that entire property was rezoned um, now that it's not a hospital anymore. I know that they sold four pieces of land. They did well. They sold uh, they sold uh, 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 several parcels in the jewelry district to Brown University. That was that was in um, that was in the news uh, maybe a month or so ago. So. So I, I think this is a, a, a good opportunity, right? Because we're looking at the comprehensive plan. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I agree with Manuel on the time frame because five years seems like a long time, but it's not for for a, a, you know for all the details that goes into you know um, this type of um, plan. However, um, you know, we started this in the '80s. I think you said if we can look at putting some more teeth in in their plans when they come on board, so that they're not just addressing their immediate commercial interests, um, but look at the um, um, the neighborhood in general. Um, there's a reason why colleges 
do you take these things more into account than healthcare because their clientele are students who are looking for those things. They're biking, they're walking. So it's not necessarily that they're looking at it from a neighborhood perspective, but their own clientele benefits from it. While when you look at the patients and the staff, um, they would benefit, but they probably not demanding the same type of um, usage of, of, you know, green space and, and, and the different types of, of uh, traffic patterns. But if we can look at finding a way to put more teeth on these plans when they come forward every five years so that they look at the impact on the immediate community, the city, um, so that we can see what these benefits are um, or for them to add more benefits. I mean, because as we mentioned, they provide great services, but it does come to a cost. And um, I think the healthcare facilities that we're talking about in general, um, I mean, specifically right now, um, the neighbors will say that there's been a huge, huge cost to that area. I mean, there's not much erosion of residential areas because there aren't that many residential areas. If you look at Dudley, there's one house what, who, whose family I know, and they're the ones that held out and they built lots right around them on all four <laughs> sides. Um, so there, is the, there isn't any more opportunity for erosion unless they go you know, further into neighborhoods. But, um, but I think, I think that's, the, that's, the, that's the, the tone of this. I think we, we need to rethink the way we, we see these, these institutional yeah, I, master plans. I know, but we're getting awfully green. I yeah. um, want to point out that this is a business they are bringing people in who are sick. Uh, they 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 have they have to be attractive to doctors. They have to be attractive to nurses. They have to be attractive attractive to investors. I mean, they they got to run this hospital somehow or other and, and come out of it making money. And they have to maintain levels of, san of sanitation that no dormitory. Cleaning lady ever well, I, I do think this this yeah. this warrants a, a larger, broader conversation than the yeah. master plan that's, that's in front of us. You want to talk about um, solar or something like that? We can have one. <laughs> so, my, my question. <laughs> sorry, one question. Is this like that's it? Like ten minute presentation every five years? And that's the master plan review. If there's no change, right? It, 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 it certainly could be. Yeah, it that's could kind of like it could be that. Like, oh, that's nice information, but. We've seen we've seen much more in-depth uh, discussions and presentations, and we've seen shorter um, from from <clears throat> institutions. We saw the self-responsibility go down. I think yeah. this is. It's it's all I'm good conversation, go but yes, <laughs> I, I think we, we are we are. Motion that we approve the IFP subject to the commission regarding the landscaping plan. Okay, we have we have a motion on the table. Do we have second. a second? We have a second. All right, let's go around. Manuel? Aye. Miguel? Aye. Noel? Aye. Harry? Aye. Nicole? Aye. And I vote aye. Thank you very much. Before we adjourn, there are two things. The first is I want to welcome Miguel back. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm, welcome I'm, back. I missed I'm, you guys. I'm, I'm slightly welcome saddened back. to see you back because that means that you're, you're here with us again and not doing something else. But uh, I'm very happy to have you back as a, as a fellow commissioner. I appreciate the sentiment. Thank you. And then there was another, uh, we're trying to uh, line up a meeting. Yeah, 11, uh, ne next Tuesday, the 18th. Uh, I know that Harry said he could make it. Noel said he could make it. Uh, Man Manuel, uh, Manuel's a no. Yeah, I, I think the only one we haven't heard from who's at the table is, is Miguel. No, this Would, is the, yeah, you sent an invite for both meetings, right? 18th. Yeah, yeah. You, you could make the 18th. Yes. I, I okay. Yeah. So we, if we could, if we could get Chris Potter um, to to uh, to make that, then we'll have a meeting. So we'll we'll uh, check in with folks tomorrow on that. Um, the only other last thing I I'd want to say is is um, get your food before you leave. All right. I guess we'll take a motion to adjourn. So oh, there we go. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole, for uh, pinch hitting there. Yeah.